I was patrolling my usual forest trails at night. I've been a ranger for eight years now, and nothing had ever scared me as much as this one experience that I encountered. Well, what I think was a Bigfoot. Doing my routine patrol on this night, it all started with me walking along the same trail I do at night to do my rounds. Being Florida, it had rained earlier in the day, so everything was calm and peaceful, minus the puddles of mud here and there. The sun had set about an hour or two before, which meant it was exceptionally dark outside, although I was already used to this. The moon was barely out. I saw a few other rangers patrolling with me, but they had passed by. And somewhere out of nowhere, maybe about 30 minutes later, I was walking along the dirt trail when I noticed something appeared in front of me. A dark, large figure coming from the right side of the path, and then crossing in front of me as it headed off into some thick brush off to my left, palmettos. Actually, this is directly where I patrol, meaning there should most definitely not be anything even remotely close to resembling whatever this thing was. Its speed is what surprised me and took me off guard, considering it didn't even give me enough time to turn around and see what it looked like. All I could make out was that it was jet black, very tall and easily taller than I was. It moved quickly. I didn't even have time to react until laughter had already gone into the bushes, disappearing as quickly as it had appeared, deep in the palmettos. My heart sunk and I felt an odd sensation. It was this incredible feeling of fear. All I could think about is how much more dangerous it had just made my job that night. If there was some large animal out here that moved fast, was taller than I, and larger than I, that actually crossed paths with me like it did, what else might be lurking on here? Would it cross paths with me again? Was this thing actually looking for me? As I thought about it more, I considered the fact that if something was after me, then maybe whatever it was might be prepared to attack. Although I wasn't going to back down without a fight, I began getting angry. Maybe it was my mind playing tricks on me, but I was a few hours away from my shift ending and talking myself into returning to the station, telling myself that if I did, I would be safe. If this thing is out there, it's just as much looking for me as it is anybody else. So now, more than ever, Getting to my ranger station was my only priority. I didn't really know what it was or what to think about it, but there was only one way to find out, and that was by continuing my patrol. Now, I stood still for a moment, debating with myself on whether or not I should continue, remembering all the times going back home early had made me feel like a failure. Although I had never encountered anything like this before, it didn't mean there's nothing out there. It only means that whatever it was hadn't bothered me yet. But now that it had crossed paths with me, I might be next on this list of things to kill. That would have made me sick. The rest of my story is pretty uneventful, unfortunately. After this, not a lot happened. I didn't see the figure again. And as I look back on this event and reflect, I believe I encountered a skunk ape, a Bigfoot native to the Florida Everglades. While it was probably harmless and didn't want to actually hurt or kill me, it was still completely terrifying. I still don't know if this creature was real or not, but that didn't matter. Regardless of what it actually is, I'm convinced that whatever it was, it wanted to hurt me. Or so I had convinced myself and still wonder. So my husband and I were watching a scary movie. We don't usually watch scary movies, but we thought it would be fun since our kid was staying with his grandparents for the night. About halfway through the movie, we got bored of it and decided to call it a night. It was around 11.30 p.m. We were watching it in our bed, so we just turned off the TV and lights and laid down. Within maybe 30 seconds of turning off the movie, I hear a man talking. It sounded like it was coming from our basement. We live in a log home, and we sleep in the loft, which is open to the rest of the house. The stairs leading up to our room are made of half logs, so you can peer through them and see down into the stairs leading directly below into the basement, which also has no door. At first, I thought maybe I was imagining it. 
I have auditory hallucinations before I fall asleep all the time, so I thought that's what it was. We have a German shepherd who sleeps at the top of the stairs in the loft with us, and she hadn't seemed to notice anything. About ten seconds after hearing the voice, I hear several other sounds. Sounds of something moving in the basement, jostling and gentle thuds. At this point, my husband whispers, Did you hear that? And I'm like, Yes. And he says, It sounded like a man talking. And I'm like, OMG, yes. So he jumps out of bed, puts on his robe, gets the gun, and starts checking around the house. I have my phone up ready to dial 911 if need be. He starts in the basement, nothing. All the windows are closed and locked, and the alarms on them are undisturbed. Same with the sliding door. We check the rest of the house and still nothing. I'm super freaked out at this point. He has to get up early for work, so we go back upstairs to our bed. He goes to sleep, but I'm too freaked out, and I stay up with the lamp on ready to attack the sneaky intruder until around 2 a.m. when I was too tired to stay up any longer. I heard a couple more strange noises up until I fell asleep. Most of them I attributed to the house shifting. My box fan made a high-pitched squealing noise a few times, which I've never noticed before. Almost sounded like bats squeaking. I just cannot relax about the situation because I can't come up with a solution as to why this happened. The house was secured. There's no way anyone could be inside. We live in a rural area and know our neighbors. They don't wander around our property. It just doesn't make sense. The voice didn't sound particularly threatening. It sounded like a country boy talking to his buddy. Not super loud, not quiet, just a casual interaction. Edit. I previously selected the wrong tag for this post. My bad guys. I don't believe in ghosts. If I see someone I don't know and trust like on TV, for example, telling a ghost story, I struggle to believe them. That being said, I had an experience when I was around 10 years old that I'm going to share today. This was in approximately 2003. My friend and I were walking to football training. I live in a quiet countryside town in Scotland. To get to the football training, we would walk past the tennis courts as it saved a lot of time. The tennis courts are located at the bottom of a wide, open, grassy area. Next to the tennis courts is a sloped section of ground that runs the length of the court. I think it's meant to be the stand where people can sit or stand and watch. It's sort of like a grassy pyramid that's been stretched out in length. There is a path that leads down to the stand and just stops. On the far side of the stand is a small wooded area. We were on the path walking toward the tennis courts. It was broad daylight. No one is around. The wooded area briefly falls out of view as the path is on a slight decline. We walk up the hill of the stand onto the main body of it, and there is a woman standing at the trees. She is stood with her hands clasped in front of her, looking directly at us. My friend and I are walking toward her. She is stood between a fence and a small stream that's guarded by a waist-height fence. We walk the length of the court, now less than ten meters from her. She hasn't moved. She's just continued to stand and stare. We turn at the bottom of the court now with our back to her. We haven't said a word, but we looked at each other and ran. The woman was gray in appearance, but wasn't transparent or anything. She looked like a real person, but she was a sort of uniform color. Washed out looking. Clothes included. It's quite hard to describe. She didn't move once. And I don't mean she just stood still. She didn't move at all. She was three-dimensional, but it was like she was a cutout that had been placed there. My first thought wasn't, oh my god, it's a ghost, only afterward did we realize what might have just happened. There is nowhere this woman could have came from. There are two-meter fences blocking everywhere apart from the far side entrance to the tennis court and the approach we used to get there. The far side entrance line of sight is never broken. The stand only obscures a part of the wooded section for a moment. She simply was not there. We broke line of sight for five, ten seconds, and there she was. 
The village I live in is small. I had never seen this person before, and I haven't seen her since. For a good ten years, that area would terrify me at night. I would hug the fence until I had to turn my back to the area. We saw her at which point I would run. Doesn't matter how muddy the grass was, it was genuinely too frightening to care about the condition of my shoes. I don't know how to explain this. I tell people I don't believe in ghosts if they ask, but I always offer this story as a consolation. Looking back on it, I wish I spent more time looking at her. As it was happening despite not realizing what I was potentially looking at, the unbroken eye contact was unsettling. It made it difficult to look at her. That friend and I don't speak anymore, we haven't for around 15 years. But I bumped into him in the town about four years ago. The first question I asked him once the greetings were over and done with was, Remember we saw that ghost? He said, I do mate, I... So a few years later, my cousin and I went out to check deer feeders or stands. As we were crossing a field to get to a deer stand that was set up on poles eight, ten foot off the ground, we noticed what we presumed to be a head peering over the top of the wall watching us. We were a good 100 yards off, but it was obvious that something was in the stand. My cousin wanted to go check it out, but I got spooked. I don't know if it was that uneasy feeling of predation or my past encounter with vagrants at our lease. But I talked him out of confronting whatever was up there. We hustled back and told our dads what we had seen. We went back to the stand, but didn't see anything watching us this time, so we crossed the field, climbed the pipe ladder to the landing, and found open cans of soup, some dirty clothes, and a mutilated fawn. Whoever had been squatting in our deer stand had killed, and was eating a young deer without benefit of cooking as far as we could tell. There was blood everywhere. Could this be Sasquatch? We never did run into whoever was surviving out there. Fortunate for him, because I was ready to shoot anything that moved after that. That's the last of my experiences. As you can imagine, I didn't enjoy going to deer leases as a kid. I was on my golf cart by myself, and it was completely dark outside and quiet. I live in a neighborhood surrounded by farmland and woods throughout various spots. I was driving but pulled over because this giant beetle was on my shirt. It pinched me and freaked me out. I pulled over next to a stretch of woods and struggled to get it off of me. In the woods nearby I heard walking, like perhaps a deer walking around, so I wasn't scared. Yet, the sounds got louder and closer. The walking had gotten so loud it sounded unreal, something out of Jurassic Park like a dinosaur stomping. The walking had gotten overwhelmingly loud and extremely close, so I slammed on the gas and get the F out. I looked behind me but couldn't see anything, but felt shivers down my spine because I swear it was inches behind me. Not sure if this has anything to do with it, but I was talking about skinwalkers with my sister and doing some research, so I hope that didn't invite anything. But I can't even describe how loud the stomping was. It sounded unreal and was seriously terrifying. My partner and I first heard these stories from a co-worker who overheard another officer talking about it. We thought and were convinced they were making the whole thing up. But one night, me and my partner decided to drive around the park to see if we can find anything weird for ourselves. We head down this lone dirt road, tall grass on either side, and suddenly three deer burst out in the dark to our right. Our headlights caught them moving just as they ran into the trees on the left. So naturally, we could tell they were being chased by something. We turned off the headlights and began moving very slowly, keeping an eye out for anything big. We drove slowly, more and more down the winding road until finally, something came into view in front of us. It looked like a large, hairy man crouched over, and as soon as it came out, you could just see its silhouette against the cold night sky. And since it was so dark, I couldn't see much, 
but the thing kind of turned around and began moving in our direction, and then moved away. As soon as my partner and I saw it, we got this really weird feeling, like something terrible was about to happen. So we quickly turned our headlights on. By that point, it was already gone. We pulled out of there, left pretty quickly. I don't even want to acknowledge what that could have been. I don't think I'm ready to accept that reality just yet. My uncle usually hosts winter parties at his house every year. One year, his basement was flooded, so we had no choice but to hold the party somewhere else. It was held at a nearby lodge. On the side of the lodge was a road, and across the road was a small section of trees with a pond in it. An hour or two before the party ended, my cousin and I were outside near that road. We heard a noise coming from the trees, which sounded like something stomping in the pond. Note that when I say stomping, I really do mean stomping. Not just some animal swimming around in there. Like something was deliberately and forcefully doing God knows what in that pond. My cousin and I went inside and told our other cousin, and the three of us went back out. Being teenagers and all, we decide, hey, let's throw rocks. So that's essentially what we do. A few rocks in, another rock lands in front of us. Whatever was in there threw a rock back. We all went back in and told our other cousin, our older and more smart cousin, who decided, hey, let's go over there. We start heading over to the trees, and pretty much as soon as the older cousin sets foot on the grass, the stomping gets faster and louder, as if whatever it was was running at us. We all ran back into the lodge and stayed inside for the rest of the night. True, this could have been a person, but it just doesn't make sense. What were they doing in there that late? What were they doing in there at all? I still think about what it could have been. It doesn't help that my cousins don't even remember. So there's a mountain range known as Kajakanoš separating Poland and the Czech Republic. About eight years ago, I was coming back from Prague to Rocklaw and missed the last bus from the Czech side Harachov to the Poland side Sklaskoporba. It was summer, about 7 p.m., so there was still a lot of light. I decided to cross the mountains through a low pass, figured I'd reach Poland before dawn. The journey had been uneventful until about 2 a.m. That's when I started hearing a high-pitched, wailing sound. It sounded a lot like a whale's call. It felt terribly sad and lonely. I started looking around, searching for its source. The moon was high and the sky was clear, so the visibility was really good. I saw it among the trees, about a 100 meters from me. It was moving slowly, carefully testing the ground before proceeding. Its siren's call made me shiver. The creature looked like a giant spider with a bat's head placed on a long, thin neck. Its ears were huge and probably highly sensitive it turned its head, as if noticing my presence, but it didn't seem to mind me and continued to move slowly and wail. It was about three meters long, one five meter tall. It didn't do anything paranormal except for well existing. What I felt wasn't exactly terror, it was more of awe and profound sadness. I remember thinking it might be the last one of its kind, that its calls had been a dying song. After watching it for a few minutes, I proceeded to follow the trail and eventually reached the town of Szklaska Porba around 5 a.m. I remember feeling really strange for a couple of days afterwards. Hello, something happened last summer that has left me with many questions and few answers. I was employed at an appliance and furniture rental and sales business in Great Bend, Kansas. One morning a co-worker and I opened the store. When we arrived we noticed that the back door was open and when we entered the back room all the lights in the store had been turned on. It didn't look like a break-in because the security latch was intact. The security system had been disabled, there was no power indicator on the code box. We immediately called the police and the store manager to report the situation. We were told not to open the store 
and to remain in the back office until someone arrived. A few minutes later, after hanging up the phone with the store manager, a police officer was knocking on the back door. I left him in and told him what we had found when we arrived. The officer started to walk through the back room and into the showroom when we started to hear a baby cry. I thought that a customer may have somehow entered the store and that they had a baby with them. My co-worker and I followed the officer in the direction of the crying well. I didn't believe what I saw. There were two babies lying on a twin-size bed display. The officer told us to stay there while he checked the rest of the store. He had also radioed for another police officer to come to the location. I looked down at the babies who were both tightly wrapped in dark green cloth. Both babies were quiet, very still, and looking at me and my co-worker. I was taken aback by their odd eyes. Both babies had large pupils that were black. There were no irises and neither of the babies blinked. The police officer was soon back with us. He commented on the baby's eyes as well. In fact, he was totally freaked out so much so that he looked scared. The store manager soon arrived as well as a senior police officer. We all stood around the bed looking at these strange babies who lay there quietly watching us. The store manager pulled my co-worker and me to the side and told us to go ahead and leave. He was not opening the store until he found out what was going on. We quickly headed toward the back door and left. I wasn't scheduled to work until a couple days later, but I had talked to a few co-workers who said that the atmosphere in the store was very strange. They had been receiving weird telephone calls and the security system alarm would trip on several times during the day. I got to work a little early for my next scheduled shift. When I arrived, the store manager was sitting in the office, so I asked him what had happened after we had left. He said that two young women, who said they were from the municipal court, eventually showed up and took the babies. The senior police officer told him later that he had no idea who the women were, but that he was told by his superior not to impede. He thought they were probably from McConnell AFB in Wichita. He also said that the babies were very quiet and seemed relaxed the entire period that they were there. I stopped working there not long after. Things were just never the same, and it got tougher each day, especially when odd-looking people would come into the store and just walk around. I didn't feel comfortable being there. February or March, I think. 1988 or 1989. Maybe 1990 but I doubt it. There were four adults and three older children in the car. We were waiting for Antrak to show up. It was close to dusk. Something came across our viewway across the tracks, maybe 200 feet away. I could be wrong about the distance. On the far side was the edge of the forest. Walking along the edge of the forest in southerly direction was a big brown hairy creature. At first we thought it was someone in costume, but soon realized it wasn't and that it was a real. There's this stretch of river far north of town that I liked hiking alongside. I'd never seen anyone else out there and I enjoyed the simplicity and peacefulness of that isolation. One morning I took my dog with me and we were crossing a shallow stretch of the river while she was tethered to my belt. She's a calm, friendly dog, hardly ever barks, and is always happy to meet strangers and other creatures. But when we reached the middle of the river, she suddenly started barking and jumping around on a tether like something was coming at us. I swiveled around and saw that she was just barking at some middle-aged guy in an oversized red t-shirt standing on the riverbank we'd just left. At first I was relieved that it wasn't a mountain lion or bear, so I waved to him and said hello. But he just kept standing there staring at us without any expression on his face. Meanwhile my dog kept snarling, barking and pulling at her leash like she wanted to get free to go kill him, completely uncharacteristic of her. I tried to get her to calm down, but she was lost in her fury, so I just started slogging my way towards the other riverbank towing her behind me. 
I kept glancing back at the guy and saw that he'd started pacing up and down the riverbank still watching us. I waved to him again and told him to have a good day, stranger. But again, he didn't acknowledge it. Just kept pacing and then stopping to stand there staring at us. Dog kept going nuts with the barking and snarling until we climbed up the other riverbank and put a few layers of trees and rocks and foliage between us and the guy. The rest of the hike, whenever she'd tense up and perk her ears up and look off into the woods, I'd get a bit paranoid and fish the folding knife out of my pocket in case. It was the red shirt guy following us and not just some little critter drawing her attention. Took a roundabout, long way back to my car that crossed the river in a different spot from where we'd seen him. I want to preface before that I've always somewhat believed in these type of creatures aliens, skinwalkers, windigos, spirits, etc. But I've always been the kind of person who doesn't 100% believe or not in something. I've just always believed that it's possible so why not? But of course, just like anyone else who hasn't experienced something, I had my doubts. Also, I wanted to add that I am not the type to be scared of entities. When it comes to what I believe and how I see spirits, I am never scared of them. I understand them and I have always connected with them. Last night, I was with my partner and our friend, and we were at a place called Rafe's Chasms in Gloucester, Massachusetts. We got there at about 9.30 p.m., and we were just going to have a fire on the rocks by the water. You had to walk through some wooded area to get to the rocks, and as we pulled up to the area, I had a bad feeling for some reason, and usually trust my intuition, but I told myself I was just psyching myself out. Once we got to the spot, I immediately felt a weird feeling, but again, I told myself I was just making things up. Even so, I didn't turn my back to the open space, and I was turned facing towards the woods or rock area. As the people I were with watched the fire, I stared out into the darkness, feeling like something was watching us. I decided to go to a rock further away from the fire so my eyes could adjust to the darkness. And lo and behold, I see a translucent white figure about 50 feet away from us on top of the rocks on the other side of the area pretty high up. It was moving back and forth, and it looked about five, six feet tall. It starts to scale down the rocks, and when I say scale, I mean fast like faster than humanly possible. And as it's doing that, it gets smaller and turns into the shape of an animal like a coyote or wolf shapeshifters usually are said take form as one of these. I say, is that an animal? And my partner looks over and immediately gets super sketched out just as I was. The other person we were with wasn't bothered by it for some reason. He said he saw it, but in the moment was trying to convince us it was a person. He was drunk as I see it coming towards us. I get absolutely horrified that it's going to kill us. I tried to go up higher on the rocks to get away from it. I literally thought that was it. I thought I was going to die. I had the most horrifying feeling and it was genuinely the scariest, most terrifying thing I have ever felt or seen. I pulled out my phone and shined my flashlight on it to make sure I'm not tripping, and I think that it deterred whatever it was away from us because it ended up running into the woods and disappearing. My partner and I were completely horrified and my legs were violently shaking. I said that we need to leave immediately. The friend that we were with wanted to stay to finish his drink, but we wanted to go. He told us that he would prove that it was a human by trying to run down the rocks as fast as he could to prove that a human could go that fast. But when he did, we could hear him running around. And that's the scary part about what we saw. It was completely silent as it went down the rocks and back up them. We weren't able to process what had happened until we had gotten home after we dropped our friend off. When we did, we decided to do some research about skinwalkers and the area where we were. Here's what we found. The first few things that come up when you Google Rafe's Chasm in Gloucester is several articles of deaths that have occurred right where we were. Now, each one states that the deaths were from the waves knocking the people off and drowning them. But this wasn't what freaked us out. I continued to scroll and I came across this weird website. It was a website for stock photos 
but for some reason the description included the name of the location we were. When I clicked the website, I literally could not believe what I saw. Proof is attached the image of whatever creature that has looked a lot like what we had seen earlier that night. We still have no idea what to make of this situation, but all I know is I am still scared. Also, needed to add that earlier in the night I heard an owl, and I made sure I said something about it to my friend and partner because I love owls. I just heard one woo. I later in the night read that an owl is the eyes for the walkers, which is very interesting. Has anyone else experienced something like this? Back when I was like six, or maybe seven, thirty years ago, I was an unknown predator as a child. Lived in a trailer park, so during the summer, it was literally Lord of the Flies from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. One day, while me and a friend were snooping around people's yards, we found a rowboat behind a shed. The thing was rotted, falling apart, and just not fit for use. But my friend got all excited and said he knew where a lake was we could go sailing at. So we grabbed some skateboards and two-by-fours for oars and proceeded to stead the boat. It took four hours of dragging it, and another two hours of moving it through swamp and forest. But we get to the lake my friend was talking about. To us it was a lake, but really just a pond. We're excited about a job well done and just throw everything into the boat and start rowing out with the two by fours. We get out to the middle of the pond and we started to realize we're taking on water, lots of water and fast. We start to panic because we can't scoop out water faster. Then it's leaking in when suddenly we hear a hollow dumum and scratching sound. The boat was sitting on something and we were no longer sinking but still taking on water. We take off our shirts, socks, and stuff them into spots. We could see water leaking in and finally relax. We can get water out faster than it was coming in. It was then we had a chance to take in the surroundings. It was pretty awesome for a six-year-old, and we're talking about six-year-old stuff for a few minutes, and then I looked down into the water. It was really clear and seemed deep, and then I realized what I could see and what we were stuck on. In the pond, we could see hundreds of 50-gallon metal barrels. They were piled up so high in some places, the boat had gotten stuck on one of them. It was like looking into an alien world with mountains of barrels everywhere. I think I had just seen Return of the Living Dead, which starts with kids opening a 50-gallon barrel and releasing the undead I think so I was freaking out and tell my friend we need to get out fast. So we're panicking and getting water out of the boat, and then my friend screams and points down the road, and we both see something worse than undead zombies. The trailer park manager in his truck, flying down a dirt road near the pond and coming right for us. Now it might not sound like much, but this was the guy who got you in serious trouble. Trailer park parents generally didn't care what the kids did, but when he shows up to your house to threaten your parents with being kicked out because of what your kid did, you knew you were in for a memorable beating. He pulled up near the pond and were trying to row away from him, but we were starting to sink again. He grabbed a rope and threw it out to us and pulled us in. We were terrified. We knew we were in for some serious screaming from him and beating from our parents. But he didn't scream, didn't threaten. He just stood there staring at us. He asked us what the hell we were doing out there, that we were trespassing, stealing, and what we were doing was wrong. But not screaming. He was calm, kind of scared, like we got him in trouble. We explained what we were doing there, but didn't bring up seeing the barrels. He questioned us forever, we were six, and then told us he wouldn't tell our parents, which was crazy because he told parents everything he saw and would bring us home if we agreed to never go out there again and to not tell our parents, otherwise he would tell them about all the crimes we committed. He dropped us off back in the park and we never heard anything about it again. One thing that did change was he never was mean to the two of us again but was a bastard to every other kid. He never told our parents about anything we did wrong and was never mean or threatening to myself or my friend again. My 
uncle saw a skinwalker. So as I said this happened to my uncle when he was about my age, I'd say early 20s, maybe 18 or 19. Must have been the 70s in that case. He was out in the Wyoming wilderness tending to a ranch house. Just him and his girlfriend. The owner was out and had him go up to take care of the animals until he came back. A few days in and everything was well. Animals well, uncle well. He decides to retire for the night. Goes in the cabin with his girlfriend. Sun goes down, they pass out. Uncle wakes up to the pitch black and this horrific hypnagogic scream. It was one of those things he later recalls that he hoped he had only dreamed. So he lays there for a bit. Things seem okay. Girlfriend doesn't stir. Tries to drift back off. But before he can another one comes. This time undeniably real. Girlfriend wakes and the dog started barking. My uncle gets up and grabs the shotgun. Heads for the door, but realizes the scream isn't alone this time. Another voice chimes in. Then another, to eventually form what he would later describe as a little chorus of suffering. He starts to back away slowly from the door. And that's when the chanting started. Listening to him tell the story, you'd almost start laughing at this point, unless you were really looking on him, because he was dead serious and full of all those little micro-expressions that happen as you really recall something. He could hear their footsteps creak up and down the small wooden porch of the cabin. The chanting from multiple voices, multiple footsteps. By this time, him and his girlfriend are in a shadow in the corner of the cabin, away from the windows and the light of the fireplace, shotgun leveled at the door. He says it felt like forever, animals screaming, them chanting, him shaking, girlfriend crying. In hindsight, it must have only been 30 minutes or so. Then it all stopped. Not all at once, though. One by one, the barking stopped. One by one, the screams stopped. Until the last one. With which the footsteps and chanting came to an end. My uncle sat huddled in the corner, though. For several hours. Eventually, the sky started to brighten with that morning blue against the silhouette of the pines. He waited a while longer, until the sun crept over the mountain range before making his way to the window. He had an idea of what he'd see. He'd hunted big game and small game, but this was different. The porch was empty, but the cabin ground weren't. He peeked his shotgun out the front door, slowly opened it. There in the morning sun, a nice cool morning, he recalls, birds chirping, air fresh. The ground was strewn with dead animals. Blood everywhere, everything dead and dissected guts and organs strewn about. He puked right there on the porch when the smell hit him. Regaining his composure, he made his way around the animals. An odd detail, he thought in retrospect, were the rubber bands tied around the testicles of some of them. He'd seen enough. Him and his girlfriend noped the F out. They made it to town, called the police and the owner. Not sure what came of it, he gets visibly shaken to this day just when it's mentioned. He says he thinks it was those skinwalkers, but he's a superstitious backwoods hick more or less. I live in Portland, Oregon, but I work at Mount Rainier National Park as a backcountry ranger. I would like to remain anonymous, so please refrain from including my name. On the night of the 5th of September 2015, I was driving home from work after a busy day of trail maintenance on the Ara Loop. I was about 15 miles east of Paradise at about 1.30 a.m., and I was doing about 50 miles per hour. I was driving on the Lewis River Road. It was a beautiful night, and I was enjoying the drive. I had my headlights on high beam and was watching my mirrors to avoid deer as they frequent this area, and in the past, I've nearly totaled my car in the winter when a large buck jumped out. As I rendered the corner coming out of the forest, I noticed a large dark figure on the side of the road. Now immediately I'm on edge because in my mind, I'm imagining this being a large buck about to jump out from my car, and I could not afford the time to make another car payment. 
I immediately slam on my brakes because I wasn't sure what was going to happen, and I realized it was not a deer because this thing was standing beside a tree on the road's shoulder. So I slowed down even more. I began to focus what little eyesight I had on this creature, and I could see that it was very, very large, probably about eight feet tall, covered in shaggy long hair that looked very thick and matted. It was hard to tell in the lighting conditions and shadows any real details of the face, but I could tell that it turned to look at me directly, and then stopped and stepped off the road into the field. It was obviously aware of my presence and did not seem surprised by me. They continued to walk away from the road into the field, lumbering on two legs. I'm telling you now it was not a bear because it never walked like one. It reminded me of a person on two legs the entire time, the comfortability of bipedally walking. It walked for about a minute, maybe a minute and a half, before I could not see it anymore. I was in shock, to say the least. I drove very slowly for a minute to see if maybe I could see it again, but I eventually lost sight of it. Even though I was in shock, I did not feel too scared. I did not feel threatened. I was just in total awe at what I just saw. It was so huge and very obviously not a bear or a person in a suit. Why would somebody be out here in the middle of nowhere? It also walked very naturally on two legs. I went back to the spot the next day and measured a tree it was standing beside. That's how I know it was around eight and a half feet tall. I've been a park ranger for the better half of eight years now and have never seen anything like this before in my life. I have had other interesting experiences though in the backcountry, but they were mostly while working and related to the environment. People are always throwing around the term Bigfoot, but I have no idea what this was. I'm ignorant, please excuse me, and thank you for your time. If you can provide any information, that would be most helpful. Thank you again. May of 1985, we were dispatched to a rural area of Placer County, California, investigating some possible dog or livestock killings. The crime was that the owners found their dogs dead in the backyard, and one of their goats was taken from the pen and killed, pulled apart like a piece of chicken. What was strange about this is that any animal abducting goats or hens would generally eat on them, not take their prey and pull them apart and leave the body. When we got there at first we saw nothing, but when we began to walk around by our cars, we could hear something, something breathing pretty heavily, like it was running and getting closer. So we walked around some more and could see what looked like a little person hiding behind two trees, just about 50 yards out, looking at us. My partner actually recognized it at first, that it looked like a human face or maybe a child, but with glowing eyes crouching down and covered in hair. Then it crouched down all fours and ran away into another tree. I was already shooting at it with my 9mm. It did not move like a human, but like that of an animal. That is when it came out of the tree and was on top of me. The rest of the incident is kind of blurry. However, I do know that nobody could find the bullet casings or even see what I had been firing my weapon. I then took them to where the creature was standing when it ran across the road. They still could find nothing. The people who worked on the case were stunned by what happened. One man said he would later go back there again if need be. He also claimed that he had been feeling something evil in the area for a while now. Take that as far as you want. Later on down the road, we also found some dead cattle in another part of the county. We were told by the owner that he had been having problems with some cattle mutilations and thought that this something that I had shot at was also killing his livestock. I know it was not the same thing because the killings were different. Another man who we spoke to had said that this goat that was killed had its stomach completely ripped open just like the others, left there to rot. My report and statement were only taken so far. With this creature having jumped on top of me, I'm surprised it did not kill me, but it did give me some pretty severe trauma that I have to live with. I can tell you that whatever this thing was, it was not a normal human or an animal. 
This was something else altogether, maybe an unknown species of some kind, something that science probably will deny. I've had a few paranormal experiences throughout my life, but the strangest and most unbelievable was what I know I used to see as a teenager. A gnome. It wouldn't have even been as tall as my knee, probably halfway up my shin. It had a red hat and a white beard. He was a typical garden gnome, only he wasn't a statue. I saw him at least a dozen times through our living room window, frolicking about in the garden and along the windowsill outside. I'd sometimes even see his silhouette through the blinds if they were closed on a sunny day. My parents, obviously, always brushed it off as silly crap kids say when I told them what I saw. Oh, don't be silly, or Awa did you? They never paid it any attention, and why would they? I even remember my father saying something to mum like, We don't even have a garden gnome. And she responded that it was just an active imagination. I lived there until I was about 18 or 19, and I don't even think anyone in our street owned garden gnomes at all. It never even once looked at me, like he didn't know I was watching, or perhaps didn't care. The last time I saw him was about 20 years ago. I'd never spoken about it to anyone but my mother and sister during my adult life, else I'd probably be admitted to a mental health ward. When I asked mum, she still remembers me talking about him when I was little. Most people reading will probably think what a load, but I promise this is true. Was he real? or possibly a fabricated memory of some kind. Why would my mind make me remember fake stuff? Has anyone else ever seen one? This happened in the western suburbs of Sydney, Australia. I spend a lot of time in Africa both on business and for pleasure. One time there were about eight of us that went camping in a national park in Zambia. I was with a friend and the other six I did not know. There were two other couples and two single females. We spent the afternoon getting to know each other and pitching our tents, had our dinner and retired to our tents for sleep. Around 3 a.m. in the morning I hear the two females freaking out. There was screaming like I have never heard before. To be honest I was shitting myself, I thought some animal was attacking them. My adrenaline was pumping like crazy. I always remember hearing that when people are screaming they are okay, it's generally the quiet ones that you should worry about. So I got my torch and found the courage to open up my tent. At this point the screaming was continuing, and I could now hear scratching noises. The other members of the group were remaining very quiet. I am sure they were just dry mouthed and did not want to bring attention to their tents. I slowly opened the tent and shone the torch in the direction of the girl's tent, and I saw two hyenas walking around the tent. I know that generally hyenas are generally timid creatures around humans, but they have been known to attack and kill people in rare circumstances. By this time the guide was out of his tent and simply shouted at the hyenas and they ran off. One of the golden rules of camping in the domain of wild animals is not to keep any food around. Always keep food in sealed containers and make sure everything is clean and washed properly. It turned out that one of the girls has some biltong dried meat in the tent, and the hyenas has smelt it and were trying to get at it. This happened quite a time ago, but remember the encounter very well. My mom sent me next door to my grandma's to get something for her when the whole time felt like I was being watched, and looked over my shoulder several times. Now the distance between my house and my grandma's was long enough. Where once I reached my grandma's my home was not visible. The sighting occurred on my way back home. I was about halfway when I saw the creature. It was making a lot of noise and came crashing out of the tree line, breaking a huge tree branch. Then it began to run toward me. I remember thinking this can't be happening. I felt like my legs would not move out of fear. It all was in a time span of 5 to 10 seconds. I then ran the rest of the way home, and I tell you I have never ran so fast. 
The next day, I took my mom to the site where the creature had come out of the trees and showed her the tree branch. Lots of people I know do not believe in Bigfoot, so I normally would shy away from telling my story. I do know for a fact that what I saw was indeed Bigfoot. Okay, so I'll try to make this relatively short, so I'm not one for believing too much of cryptid lore. Never had an encounter before or anything like that. But my partner and I live on the border of upstate New York, not far from the Whitehall Bigfoot area. One night partner was taking out the garbage and came back inside startled. I mean really shook up. They said they had seen a creature that looked like maybe a fox or coyote, but that it then stood up on its hind legs and so they booked it back inside. Fast forward about a month and I'm outside on my porch smoking a cigarette, enjoying the stars under a crystal clear sky. We have a small plot next to our house that has a tow behind landscaping trailer permanently parked on it about 20-ish feet away from the house. After a while of standing outside I get the sudden and intense feeling like something is watching me. Just that primal feeling of danger. It should be noted that, like most people up here, I'm usually carrying a gun on me. Coyotes and bears are fairly common up here, so I kind of do the four corners check of my surroundings. When I looked over to that trailer, I saw there was something the size of a large dog laying in the grass. Mind you, it's a clear night with a not quite full moon, and the grass was uncut long, but not like a meadow. If I had to estimate, I'd say seven, nine inches high. So I had a really good view of this thing. Now I know never to approach a random animal bedded down at night. So I just kind of watch it for a second. Even in the light of the moon, its outline and coat were pitch black, blacker than anything I've seen before, unnaturally contrasting against the ground it laid on. Then it looks up, it has piercing red eyes, I'm thinking, ah, what the F, and put my hand on my revolver. I ain't about to be coyote food. And then, it stood up. It stood up on its hind legs. The only way I can describe the legs of it is like that goat-human hybrid from the Narnia movie, but with the torso like a hybrid of man and canine. It was taller than me, and I'm six foot one. It didn't even need to take a step. I flicked whatever was left of my cigarette and backed away to the door, locked and bolted it, and spent the rest of the night wondering what I just saw. Now I'll admit, I'm a religious man, but that thing didn't fit the description of any gin I've heard of. It's to this day one of the few things in my life I cannot explain we've installed security cameras since but now the lot is under construction and we haven't seen it since. I don't know what I saw that night truly, but I intend to find out one way or another. I want to go into the forest near the plot and look for signs. Does anyone have any advice on hunting this sort of cryptid? I'll update with any further happenings should they appear again. Me and like ten of my friends went to an abandoned mental hospital in Detroit. We just stood way back and threw rocks at it for a while, while one of us worked up the courage to actually go inside. We constantly are seeing things move in the windows of the building and small lights moving and turning on and off, but eventually half of us say F it and find the safest way in. We go through where the trucks used to unload into the building and walk down a long hallway. There's a stairwell nearby where we walked in and I heard voices in the stairwell and no one else heard it but me and my best friend, so we kept moving. We take a couple more turns, stopping occasionally because someone heard something, when soon we come across the most dreaded place we could have found, the morgue cremation room. Tons of graffiti everywhere saying stupid teenager scare tactic shit. Everyone shit themselves when we found that room, but we all chilled in it for a while until we inevitably started to leave. As we leave the morgue, it takes you into a hallway where the elevator shafts are, and there is a room across from the door. We exit, and me and my friend are walking out first, when suddenly a girl in a white nightgown steps out from the door across hall, and I shit myself. 
hoping to cut the silence and maybe get her to react because I was thinking she was like a crazy homeless crack addict. I yelled, oh shit, and she just stood there. Soon after, another guy comes out, then another guy, then another girl whose looks made me think they were actually doing heroin. Collectively, we all just went, what the F, and started talking. They told us to put our weapons down because cops go in there all the time and you're not supposed to be on the property, let alone with weapons. But we just had like scrap metal from the ground. So we put our weapons down and talked to the other group for a second while I was talking to the nightgown girl. And the ringleader, I noticed the cracked out looking one just walk away into the pitch blackness of the corridor behind her while we all had flashlights, which the kid told us to put those off too. But F that idea. We leave, and as we get on the road back to our cars, surprise, surprise, a cop pulls into the road, and we all hid at that point. It was just a couple of us, since some were farther ahead, and had made it back to their cars while the cop searched the area with his spotlight. That was a crazy or creepy night. Oh, and later that night at like 5 a.m., a dude followed me in his truck because me and my friends fell asleep in my car across the street from his driveway. So he just shined his brights into my car for like 10 minutes while we tripped out to see if he was going to do anything. Plus, we were high and tired, thus very confused. Once I had stopped at a gas station and got out, they pulled up to the pump behind me and just stayed in their truck. I walked inside to pay for gas came back out to talk to the truck guys, but they left as I was walking out. My master's degree work was looking at stoneflies in coastal Alabama, and it required a lot sampling out in the streams, the habitat for juvenile stoneflies around Mobile Bay. When I went sampling, I'd have to get into the stream and collect five packets of leaves that collected in the stream at random intervals in a 100-meter stretch of the stream. I sampled from June 2012 through July 2013 for two different projects, one that used the same four streams for an entire year and another project that used about 20 different streams in the fall and spring season. When I went sampling, I parked an old Ford Econoline van with a big university sticker on it by the side of the road, near a bridge, then climb down and hop in the stream and go to work. With these streams being out in the woods and some of them being damn remote, creepy stuff happened every so often from metal scrappers asking for any good finds, a decrepit old baby doll in the woods, walking up on a dog grave site under a bridge, a truck stopping on the bridge of a 30 meter wide river terrible place to sample for my work by the way and watching me and my sampling partner from a distance and so many other things I could keep going on, but this is the time I truly felt I was going to die. At the beginning of my field work in the summer, it was easy to coordinate with lab mates to get a sampling partner to make the work easier and safer, but late in the fall to the 12 semester, my main sampling partner had finished her thesis and didn't come to campus much can't blame her, so I started sampling by myself in later November or early December. It added some extra time onto my day, but it made scheduling easier and more consistent and nothing dangerous had happened going solo, so I was good with the change. It was the early spring of 2013 and I was traveling to the second stream of the day, hitting a stream I'd seen twice a month for the last seven or eight months. I knew it like the back of my hand and thought I'd seen everything it had to offer. I rolled up about 10 a.m., munching on an apple I had started when I left the previous stream and tossed the apple core into the clearing that I had parked the van in. This stream had a nice clearing off the side of the road, but was a 30 meter or so walk to the stream with a slight decline over eroded dirt and gravel so I couldn't see the other side of the stream. I blissfully rolled up my trusty, punctured chest waders and walked to the trunk, packed up my gear, grabbed my subber sampler, a fine mesh net that attaches to a folding base and metal meter stick. I casually strolled down to the stream ready to take my usual piss under the bridge as I do at every stream when across the stream I see a dog. I think it is a border collegerman shepherd mix but I am not that great with dog breeds. 
I stop in my tracks staring at it waiting to see if its owner will show up from the woods, but mostly debating if I could still piss, but the dog takes the first move. It makes a loud solitary bark and then runs off into the woods downstream. It promptly returns, but it isn't alone. There is another identical dog with it. They don't make any noise. They just stand attentively on the other side of stream staring at me. I can't make out any collars around their neck, but they had a lot of fur there is about 20 meters separating us since neither of us are that close to the stream bank. The stream bank is relatively high from the water, about 2-3 meters where the standoff happened, and I was on the side with a small steep entrance so I figured I could get my work done and the dogs would leave me alone. As I'm climbing down they are mirroring my distance into the stream, but not getting closer to the edge of the stream. I check over my shoulder to still see them watching me from the clearing and still think I'm fine so I start walking upstream. The dogs keep following me, but now they enter the forest. These dogs were not frolicking around the woods. They hunched down, hid behind trees and foliage to conceal themselves, and were dead silent. I couldn't hear them move over the sound of the stream. This is when I am proper spooked. As I kept going and they kept following me, I started to move closer to the opposite bank as often as could and was walking slower than usual in the shifting sands and rushing water, making sure that I didn't lose my footing. Every five meters or so, I would stop to locate them, but there were several times that I lost where they were. I didn't need to see them to feel their eyes out in the woods. Over time, they stopped staying parallel with me and began to stay slightly behind me. After what felt like an eternity, I made it to my fifth sampling spot 95 meters into the stream. Just my luck that day, the longest sampling for the day had wild dogs. I felt a wave of relief since I could now turn around and make my way back to the van, but I had to stay in the stream since the stream banks were still too steep to climb out. The dogs had a different plan. All the way through the stream they stayed together, but now they spilt up. One stayed about three to five meters ahead of me, while the other one was behind me about three to five meters. They hadn't made an advance and were still hiding in the woods, but having one in front and one behind filled me with dread. Walking in, it was easy to keep my back from being exposed and face them, even if I couldn't see them, but now things changed. I turned so I was parallel with the stream banks the dogs were on and began to make my way downstream. The dogs maintained this pattern for about 70 meters before things become decidedly more dangerous. About 20 meters from the clearing, there is a gradual slope that leads to the water on the dog's side of the stream. The dog ahead of me stretches its lead while the one behind me comes down the slope and enter the stream with me. I raise my meter stick towards the dog in the water and my subber sampler net to the dog on the stream bank in front of me and begin to yell. Basically, I look like the science nerd version of the gladiator with the net and trident. I can see the clearing, but my eyes just keep darting from dog to dog and I am slowing backing towards the clearing. The water near the stream dog deepens and luckily for me, it doesn't want to swim for its meal. It runs up the slope and joins its comrades still ahead of me. From here until the gravelly steep slope on my side of the stream, the dogs stay ahead of me hiding in the brush, but never making a move. I scrambled up the slope and starting making my way to the van. The dogs come out of the woods and advance to the edge of the stream bank. I just kept facing them while backing my up to the van. Once I got back to the van, I hurriedly packed everything back up and left before I could eat my lunch at the stream site. I had to return to that stream about eight more times, but I never saw those dogs again. It was the longest two hours of my life. I was driving west on US Highway 2 between the city of Ball Club and Benham, Minnesota. This occurred on March 3, 2019 at around 7.15 p.m. I was approaching a black vehicle, and as I got closer it increased its speed keeping pace with me. I was within 100 yards of the vehicle. 
It went into the oncoming lane of traffic and accelerated, causing the rear of the vehicle to drop slightly. At that instant, a very large cloud of white smoke filled the highway. I slowed my vehicle and turned toward the shoulder on the north side of the highway. As I went through the cloud, I expected to see the vehicle stopped or black marks on the road. Once I was in the cloud, I could see out, but it was still thick. I watched the ditch on the south side of the highway as well, but saw no evidence of the vehicle leaving the roadway. I expected to smell burnt rubber from the tires skidding or spinning on the highway, but there was no smell. As I came out of the cloud, I could see for a couple of miles as the highway was straight. There were vehicles approaching from some distance to the front, but no one going in my direction. I looked in my rearview mirror and there was another vehicle coming around the cloud on the north side also. I wanted to stop that vehicle to see what they saw and thought of the encounter, but I didn't feel comfortable with that knowing how to get them to stop. All I can tell you about the vehicle is that it was a mid-sized black sedan. Nothing special at all about it. I couldn't wrap my head around what I had just seen, and for nearly an hour the hair on my arms stood straight on end. It was a very strange experience. I didn't see it in the air or anything, so maybe not connected to a UFO. The only other explanation I can conclude would be spiritual or a ghost, if you will. No matter what, I am still very freaked out and bothered by what I witnessed. When I was very young, under 10, my dad would take us to various deer leases for the weekends here in central Texas. There were always cabins of some sort for us to stay in. This one weekend, we went to a lease near Eagle Lake, where there was an old frame house, one room affair, really, that was at the end of a very windy road. You couldn't see the house until you came right up on it. Well, this one weekend, we came driving out of the oaks only to notice that there was smoke coming from the chimney, trash all over the yard, etc. There weren't any vehicles, though. My dad stopped the truck, got out his rifle, glassed the house for a little while, then decided whoever was there must have cleared out when they heard the truck coming, and seeing as how there was no way we would have missed a vehicle leaving, they must have bugged out on foot. I still have dreams 20 years later about walking into the house to look around. Whoever had been there obviously loved to smoke as there were ashes and cig butts everywhere. Most of the canned goods we stored up there had been eaten, the cans dumped in the yard, and there was a pot of deer corn, yes, deer corn, boiling on the stove. The thing that has stuck with me over the years was the smell and the open coloring books scattered on the table with crayons dropped in mid-coloring. Out there in the woods was some poor family with at least one kid. I imagined they sat watching us for quite some time before giving up and wandering off. My dad, lacking much sense, decided that we were staying the weekend. Yah didn't sleep much. My hunting partner Ed and I were into the second week of the Oregon bow season. It was about six when we came upon a stock pond. These ponds are fed by a small spring or small creek. We decided to circumnavigate it to see if we could see what was watering in the area. I went left, Ed went to the right. I hadn't gone far when I came to a depression in the muddy gravely pond edge. It looked like a very big heavy person had left a footprint there. I got down and saw that there were toe impressions at the front. Well, I called Ed over to see this, and he said there was another one behind the first. We backtracked the prints and found what appeared to be skid marks on the hillside of the pond. This was just next to the small trickle of water which fed the pond. A hair on the back of my neck stood right up. We went up the hill for about 40 yards, but found indistinguishable impressions in the trashy undergrowth. We went back down and tracked them in the other direction, and the impressions overturned pebbles. Broken and bent grasses went about 100 yards down a hill into a ravine thick with manzainta and small scrub oak. We then went back to the foot tracks and covered them with logs so they wouldn't be destroyed. Went home and got some plaster of Paris. 
We made the impressions, and we were shocked to find that there were definitely toes on one cast. The other was in too much gravel to make a good impression. At the same time, I took some pictures of Ed stretching to match the stride of the prince. The next week, we went into the same area, same skid road, about 300 yards past the stock tank. We were walking side by side when something to my left and slightly behind us, up the hill approximately 100 yards something caught my eye. I spun around to see what it was, and to my astonishment I saw a pair of legs running into the thick underbrush. I couldn't see all of it because of the trees. My impression was of a two-legged creature animal, with long brown hair on the legs running away from us. Ed saw the branches swinging back into place, but saw nothing else. We both got spooked and quickly went back to the truck and never hunted there again. I gave the plaster cast to my nephew in San Jose, California, and have never seen them again. I still have the photos of Ed stretching to match the stride. The footprints measured 18 foot long by 6 across the heel and 8 foot across the ball of the foot. I got some hair samples from a star thistle down in the ravine, and I still have them. I have to preface this story by saying that what I'm about to recount is a true story. I know it sounds like something out of a horror movie, but I assure you every word I'm about to share is as real as the road I drive on. My name is Jack, and I've been a trucker for over a decade. I've seen my fair share of strange things on the open road. So it was a usual route for me, driving along a desolate highway late at night. The moon was obscured by heavy clouds, casting an eerie glow over the barren landscape. That's when I saw him, standing on the side of the road, thumb outstretched. The hitchhiker seemed ordinary enough at first glance, dressed in worn-out jeans and a tattered jacket. With a sigh, I decided to offer him a ride. Little did I know that decision would alter the course of my life forever. As the journey progressed, I couldn't shake an unsettling feeling. Strange occurrences began to unfold, and I started to question my decision to pick up this hitchhiker. The air in the cab grew heavy with an otherworldly presence, and I caught glimpses of an unnatural shadow out of the corner of my eye. It was as if the very fabric of reality was shifting around us. Then, without warning, the hitchhiker's face twisted in agony, and he vomited onto the floor of the truck. I immediately pulled over, concern etched across my face. Are you okay? I asked, my voice trembling with worry. But as I glanced at him, something unfathomable happened. The hitchhiker's body convulsed and contorted in an inhuman manner. His form began to change before my eyes, morphing into a creature that defied all logic. It was a creature I struggled to find words to describe, but I'll do my best. It was completely white, bald, impossibly thin, and its humanoid shape lacked any discernible facial features. No eyes, no nose, nothing. It loomed over me, crouched in a position that made its true height difficult to determine. But let me tell you, it was towering at least nine feet tall. Fear coursed through my veins, overpowering any sense of rationality. In a panic, I threw open the door and sprinted as fast as my trembling legs could carry me. I didn't look back. I didn't dare. Only after what felt like an eternity did I finally slow down and catch my breath. But the creature was nowhere in sight. It hadn't followed me. After gathering my wits, I cautiously made my way back to the truck. My heart sank as I realized it was empty, as if the hitchhiker and the creature had vanished into thin air. Confusion and dread consumed me. To this day, I can't explain what I saw or what became of the hitchhiker or the creature. All I know is that my encounter that night was undeniably real. Growing up, we had a big house on the water set back a couple acres from the road. Most of the land around us was swamp, and when I was 14, my dog brought up part of a human arm. Mom and I were binging Heroes 2007 and Biscuit got out. 
We ignored him, and I saw the dog rush past the library window with what looked like a big all fish swinging in his jaw. I go on to bed and she hollers for me and comes to my room wide-eyed. I don't what this is. I go out and it's past the truck and garage in the wide empty space that was there. I shine a light on it and I'm not quite sure what I'm seeing. It's a piece of flesh with three little bones sticking out of one end. My vision does a complete 360 and I curse and look at mom who looks terrified. Ma, you need to call the cops. The police show up, poke it with a stick, then put it in a bag and hold it out the window as they drove to the substation. We later heard reports on CNN about people being cut up and their bodies strewn all along the panhandle. The arm was large and flabby with what looked like a small pox scar. Our area used to be a hiding place for criminals and bodies. People used to find corpses in their yards after heavy rains, we even had a guy break out of prison transport and run through our yard in the middle of the night. Gotta love Florida. I was around 15 years old and lived and still living there in the wonderful Bavarian landscape in a small village. As you might know, we in Bavaria are proud of our tradition and our beer. And so we had something what you would call a party or carnival only for people of our village. As I was the cool boy in our village, I told the other kids what we can play. We played football soccer first, but I got bored and asked my friends if we are going to run around the village and play with our wooden and a friend of mine. Even had a softer, just a weak one, though guns. So we went into barns and, and all that stuff and shoot each other. It was great fun. Till one point we were in a barn of an old farmer but everyone liked him cause he always gave us sweets and told us funny things. He was 83 at that point. One room of the barn was the old slaughter room. When we played in there in front of us was an old door, but it was locked. But I could have sworn I heard something like a quiet clicking. Generally, it was a really old barn and my dad told me that it has some underground tunnels and rooms cause of the World War Roman II. The years did pass and the old man died. His wife died almost 10 years ago and the only son and heir decided to demolish the old barn. What they found in the room with the locked door is still kinda a mystery and police and news were all at the place, but nobody besides the police and the special teams knew what it was. Later the newspapers got the information that there was an old bomb of the WW2. But fortunately, my dad helped the son with the work and saw it first together with the son. He never told me till a few months ago. Until that day, only few people knew the real story. He basically built something like a throne of old World War II souvenirs as a national coat of arms and pictures of Austrian painter. There were old radios and medal of Nazis, and a lot of letters in which he wrote about operate behind enemy lines, and in which he wrote to his wife, and that she has to be quiet. In the middle of the room there was the bomb, and it was indeed still ticking, and one of the best obtained bombs of the World War, and is now in a museum. Diffused. No one knew he was that guy. I was so shocked, and I can only tell you that people in our village still tell rumors about more tunnels and hidden rooms. On May 9th of this year, I went on a walk in the patch of woods near my house. In northern Wisconsin with my dog and older sister. My father recently passed away and to attempt to reconnect with my family, I took matters into my own hands and invited them all over for a week. Only my sister showed and, and I wasn't planning on anyone else showing. My sister has always been the stereotypical blue-haired, short astrology girl and believes in everything you can think about. When we were 12 and 14, she took me to her friend's house to hunt a skinwalker that just turned out to be a stray dog. And since then, we haven't done anything in the woods due to her sudden urge to stay inside and smoke pot for months. But that's beside the point. We were walking along a path around dusk, and it started to get very cold. 
We decided that we should set up camp as we are far too away from home to not get back before 6 a.m. and don't feel like hanging out in darkness. After setting up a small fire and tent, she called it a night while I tended to the fire. Roughly two hours after she fell asleep, I went to relieve myself behind a large dead tree. After coming back to camp, I noticed that there was a foul, almost rotten smell around the camp. I reached for my bag to get some incense and realized my bag was missing. I panicked for a second until I saw it near the edge of the light made by the fire. Thinking nothing of it, I stood up, and as I walked toward my bag, I froze. My bag was being slowly dragged farther out of the light by a very pale, human-like hand. This hand was in no way human as I came to my senses and noticed the large claws and shiny glass-like skin that seemed to be covered in a clear liquid. Who's there? Give me back my bag, I said while reaching for my pistol on my belt. Just as I fully unsheathed my pistol, the hand suddenly recoiled. However, now I could see a face. A large, terrifying face with milky white skin and eyes, with the bluest veins under the eyes. I saw that the thing's tongue was long, and was the only thing moving other than the trees in the wind. Its antlers were black, like they were made of mold. I lost it. I shot the damn thing, and with the muzzle flash, I saw a massive, deer-like humanoid that must have been seven, eight feet tall. I fell to the ground covering my ears as the creature let out a loud scream sounding like a moose that had been shoved into a meat grinder alive. I came to my senses and saw the thing charge me. I froze as it just to the right of the tent and tipped it over. My sister was already awake at this point as the scream rose her. After what had to have been two hours of making the fire go from a small forge into a massive bonfire to illuminate the surrounding woods. Eventually I fell asleep with my Glock 19 in my hands which were itching to shoot anything that moved. I awoke to my sister shaking me at what must have been 10 a.m. as the sun was already well in the sky. After getting our belongings we began walking back to the house checking our surroundings as we went. We didn't want that thing to follow us back to the house and torment us there. When we were able to see the light coming from my yard lights, which I forgot to turn off, I froze. On the top of my shed there was a gutted what seemed to be a deer without its hind legs. We dropped our stuff and ran to the house, where we called the police. I got fined for wasting their time. I tried to forget this and move on with my life, but on the 19th of this month, I saw that thing in my yard, digging a hole while a dead deer was on its broad, pale, skinny shoulders. It was staring at me. It saw me. It saw me. I blinked and it was gone. I know what I saw. I need help. I have three guns in my home, not including my pistol which I always have on me. Should I try to kill the thing? Please help me. I was 18 years old and went on a fishing trip with my four friends Jack, Zoe, Jocko and Lex. We chose a fishing spot under a bridge about one miles away from any houses. The day started out fun, with everyone excited to go fishing and relax. We walked to the spot, passing squash fields along the main road, and grabbed a few as we went along with some corn. We arrived at the fishing spot and spent a few hours fishing, enjoying the peacefulness of the surroundings. As it approached 9.30 p.m., things took a turn. Before I continue, I want to mention that one of my friends is a descendant of the Navajo tribe and believes in druidic beliefs, while I personally identify as an atheist. Suddenly, we started hearing dogs barking in the distance, as if a wild pack of dogs was nearby. However, the chances of that seemed unlikely, so we considered the possibility of coyotes. However, we soon realized that coyotes don't bark like that. They yip instead. The paranoia started to settle in, and we contemplated the idea of walking the eight miles back and drowning our worries in a bottle of rum at my friend's house. As we made our way back, a quarter of the way there, my Navajo friend abruptly stopped in the middle of the road. His expression changed from concern to sheer fear. I approached him, curious about what had caught his attention, and he grabbed my wrist, 
pointing my hand out towards the fields. There I saw a pair of eyes staring back at me, their size resembling footballs. My friend and I silently agreed to keep this sighting between us. We didn't want to freak everyone else out and risk getting separated, so we picked up the pace, forcing the others to follow along. Halfway back to my friend's house, we passed by a white farmhouse with a cornfield across from it. Suddenly, it felt like a plane buzzed by, and a forty-yard trail of destruction was left in the cornfield. Something had crashed through it, and to add to the chaos, we still heard the dogs following us. As we finally arrived at my friend's house, we pulled out a 12-gauge shotgun and a bottle of rum. We sat on the porch on high alert. In the distance, we could hear the same dogs that had been following us earlier, whining as if they were upset with us. As the night progressed, I found myself having night terrors, a combination of fear and alcohol-induced dreams. It was certainly an unforgettable experience at my buddy's house, to say the least. I was in the Navy and we spent a lot of time out at sea. I've seen mysterious clouds go into machines. The next few hours that machine would break down. No reason. Not all the technicians and actual designers could explain what happened or why. I've seen a headless shipmate floating about. Machines would break, turn off for no reason. I would call out shipmate, and the machine turns on immediately after. Chicken bones. A particular machine was a chronic offender. Then out of spite slash desperation, the technicians placed chicken bones at the bottom of the cabinet. Machine behaved. Come next audit inspection, they found the chicken bones and ordered them removed. Within four hours, while the audit team was still around, the machine failed without explanation or cause. It had to be replaced. There are stories of topsiders who saw, heard things that scared them so much they refused to go into parts of the ship, or even stand watch in certain areas again. I want to post this one dream I had like two years ago that I just remembered. The dream kind of went like thus. I went back up north to visit cousins, they live up in the mountains. I remember it being night outside while I was in the house, but I spotted a deer outside. For whatever reason I remember following it into the woods, and from there it led me to a clearing. In the was a windigo, and we just stared at each other for a good minute. I remember it saying something to me, but I forgot what it said. But from there it offered me some form of meat probably human which for some reason I ate. I remember the dream then cutting back to me leaving my cousin's house, but I also remember freaking out and hearing a voice in my head. But that's when I woke up. I also don't know if this is related, but two weeks before I took some mushrooms and remember having a trip where I was running through a forest, but when I came back to reality, I found myself bidding my hand for some reason. Does these events mean something? Last night at about 2 a.m., my dog started barking viscously. I have a German Shepherd. She's a guard dog, so I'm no stranger to aggressive barks. But this was the most intense behavior I had ever seen before. She was barking at the door, so my first thought was there's an intruder at the door. Again, I really have never heard her behave like that. I thought about getting a weapon. I was really scared someone might be at the door, but then I remembered that my cat was outside, so maybe it was my cat making a fuss. Even if it was an intruder, my dog would kill someone to protect me. I looked through our peephole, but no one was there, so I opened the door. My dog had been barking the whole time. When I opened the door, instead of going out to sniff around like she usually does, she planted herself in front of my and got even louder. She was guarding me. I have never seen anything like it from her. I looked out to see what it could be, and then I saw it. The first thing I noticed were the eyes. It was like when you shine a light on an animal's eyes, sort of glowing in the nighttime darkness. I then noticed the antlers and thought it must be a deer. 
But then I realized its face looked about nine feet above the ground. Then I noticed its body. I could make the outline and could tell it was fur, but it was standing in a human-like position, hunched over almost on its hind legs. I have never been so terrified as soon as I realized I was looking at something paranormal. I slammed the door and shut all of my windows, locked all the doors, and hid under the sheets like I was a little kid. I am still shaken up. I can't stop thinking about it. I haven't fallen asleep tonight because every time I close my eyes I see it. I'm curious what this creature was. I know the appearance of the Wendigo is debated and seems to be controversial. But I am still terrified by what I saw. If anyone has any information relative to my story, I would love some insight. Thanks to whoever believes me. One of my sons and I like to hike in the backwoods of Oregon and Washington states. Several years ago, we were on a backpacking trip during the middle of the week to several lakes on the shoulder of Mount Hood. Right at dusk, we had a super heavy something walk into our little hidden camp on two feet shaking the ground. It abruptly stopped just outside our little tent. Then there was a big whack sound from where it had walked in on us. We were zipped in the tent because it had begun to rain. We sat still because flight or fight had kicked in for both of us. We were waiting to see what the next move would be. We sat waiting for what might come next. Because of being in the woods backpacking for many years, we learned to have a cool head and evaluate what we might be up against. Then out of the deafening silence, there was an answering rock clap from the opposite side of the tent. We were now aware that we were dealing with two separate things right outside our tent. We sat waiting. Nothing. No noise. No brush or underbrush. No snuffling. Dead silence. We got out of the tent and saw nothing. Since there was only one way out of that camp, and the thing had walked in on the only path out, it was now fully dark, plus a few miles back to where our truck was parked. I made the decision to stick right there for the rest of the night. We would walk out in the morning. I rolled over and went to sleep. I know, strange, but I think the shock of it made me adapt with, and it is what it is at this point. My son laid awake most of the night expecting them to come back. They didn't. No smell. No noise beyond the two signals we heard coming from different directions. The creepiest part of the whole experience was the tranquil retreat. What animal arrives shaking the ground, sends and receives a signal, and then melts away without a sound. I was so glad my son was there with me on that trip. It is helpful to have someone who experienced it all too. Since the night that happened my son will straight up tell you there is Sasquatch in the deep woods of Oregon. It was a super odd experience for sure. I live on 10 acres in southern Oregon in the woods. I back up to BLM land that goes for miles. I am aware of what is out there beyond our door. I hope to never run into one here on our own ground. No, thank you. This is no joke for me. For context, I don't actually know if this is a Wendigo-related experience. It's just a possibility out of a thousand and due to my ignorance of the manner I came here looking for answers. For context, this takes place at my grandfather's property in Walla Walla, Washington. It was an ordinary camping trip, and I had invited my two best friends from high school. Names don't matter, so I'll just call them Frank and Chris. It was getting late at night, and we wanted to kill time before the big campfire of the night. So as fearless teenagers do, we hit the trails. We walk for about one and a half miles away from camp on a straight trail until arriving in a patch of dead forest. Which was strange because it was the only patch of dead vegetation in a 12 mile radius around the property. So this puts us of edge, it's strange and eerie. Then all of a sudden we all get hit with a sense of suspense and anxiety, and as we look at each other for confirmation of sharing the same experience we hear a foghorn. Yet again we have no neighbors. And without communicating we all know to just run. 
We ran and ran driven by primal fear. The fear that you experience when you know you are the prey. We didn't stop till we were at the fire. I don't know what it was, but whatever it was, I wasn't trying to find out. If anyone has an answer, please tell me. Mainly looking for the significance of the dead forest and the foghorn. When I was younger, my parents were stationed off the Queen Charlotte Islands in the Canadian Navy. They used to take me out with them on the boat and stuff when I was younger, so I saw tons of killer whales and all that neat stuff. My father and his Navy friends had a game when they were far out into the ocean where they would swim under their ship from one side to the other. It was uneventful and not that dangerous as the ships weren't massive warships. Anyways, one time they're all doing it. My dad goes under, comes up laughing. A few people go. Then his friend goes. His friend comes up, says nothing, sits down white as a ghost. He explains that while he was under the boat, he opened his eyes and saw an incredibly large shadowed figure moving directly under him. Not a whale or any kind of animal, and he was genuinely terrified. He spent his whole life on the ocean and has never seen anything close to what he saw. From then on, I believe he was transferred inland as he had a strong phobia of deep, dark water. When I was in my early teens, I visited my dad in Pennsylvania. He had just gotten remarried and had another child, my baby sister. Anyway, I fell asleep at my new grandmother's house downstairs. This is a three-story house with a basement and an attic five floors, and I had no clue where anyone else was. I woke up downstairs on the couch around midnight in utter terror and could not explain why. I felt as if something in the shadows was watching me and I needed to get away. I ran upstairs and got into bed with my dad who never woke up. Moments pass and I feel something on my legs. I wanted to look but couldn't look. I must have been paralyzed. It seems like hours passed as I slowly somehow began to work my head to the side and saw one of them peeking over my father with its hands over his mouth. I received a telepathic message of some kind that he shouldn't be smoking and that something bad might happen to him because of it. I don't know if it was a threat, and these are childhood memories so it's very difficult to specifically put into words. If I had to describe these little creatures they would be like salacious crumb from Star Wars, very goblin-like, very skinny with big ears. There was a bigger one standing at the foot of the bed. I was fighting this paralysis the entire time, and I think it's this ability to fight their paralysis that made them interested in me in the first place. Anyway, I see the big one who seems to have an oval-shaped flat and purple-like head with a dark cape. The body never moves, but the head can swivel 360 like an owl or something. At first, the being was extremely interested in the books on the shelf. Paperbacks and hardbacks. Novels. For whatever reason, it was checking all these books out. There were two identical ones, one bigger than the other though, marching in place in the corner of the room. They were glowing white and looked to be very furry or luminous. Big bushy circular bodies with spindly skinny appendages. A big one and a little one both glowing, both marching in place in the corner of the room, not looking at anyone. This seems to go on forever. At some point, they migrated to the next room where my little sister was sleeping in her crib. At that point, I felt strength. I felt anger. That's what it was. You are not going to touch my sister. And I shut off the paralysis and jumped out of bed. As soon as I did that, the two beings marching in the corner went down to the floor and the light began to change in the room. I saw them march downward through the floor and then I ran into the next room. The rest looked at me and floated quickly toward the stairwell as the light from 8 a.m. in the morning brightly lit the entire house and they went down the staircase and turned into indistinguishable vapor in the morning light. Believe me when I say I was in pitch black for an endless timeless state and then it was immediately eight hours afterward. That was my first experience. It gets weirder. 
So after that, I went back home to Mississippi with my mom and began having nightly experiences for the next eight or nine years. I'm not going to go into those details because they were terrifying and I don't want to think about them. But eventually, I felt that the danger must be coming from the window in my room. I didn't like my room anymore. And I had witnessed too many weird things around my window late at night. So I rearranged my room and blocked up the window by putting my bed right beside it. You'd think that this wouldn't be the right move, but it made me feel safe for whatever reason. The night I did this is the one I will never ever forget for as long as I live, and I get chills just thinking about it. I woke to the back door being kicked open, and immediately I knew that our house was being robbed. I tried to stay as still as possible in my bed with my eyes just barely cracks of lashes to be able to see what was going on, but still pretend that I was sleeping. I hear a commotion in the hallway outside my room. Thinking about it now, it could not have been adult people. These were either a whole bunch of small creatures or not actually physical disturbances. It was a commotion, a torrent of motion through the hallway. And then my bedroom door slowly crept open. Standing in the doorway was a bright ball of light. When I was a child, I figured it must be a flashlight, but my memory does not agree with that. As an adult, it doesn't make sense to me. It was simply a ball of light, and it moved on. I heard commotion throughout the house. I heard a struggle. I heard fighting and my family being in pain. I was too afraid to move. I wasn't exactly paralyzed, I felt like they were maybe testing me. Finally, I hear my mother calling my name and pain dragging herself across the carpet. I will never forget this for the rest of my life. I was too afraid to move to help my mother. But strangely, the sound of her pulling herself across the carpet never advanced. It stayed right outside my door. I felt like they wanted to lure me somehow, and I didn't understand intellectually but instinctively I knew I should stay put. This dragging noise went on for a timeless state yet again. Then, like a switch of up light bulb, it was morning and I hadn't even closed my eyes. So I ran to the phone and dialed 911, but hung up immediately. My brother was asleep in his room. My mom was asleep in her room. I woke her up and asked her what happened last night. She said your brother had an asthma attack and we left you here at home alone at midnight. So I got all into energy work and kundalini yoga and became a Reiki master and attempted to understand what this spiritual energy was that I have that allows me to fight their paralysis when I become angry and impassioned at them. This spiritual force that fights them was my main goal in life at that point. I needed them to stop and it worked for a long time. I have many more stories about this intermediate period where I kept them at bay from terrorizing me, but began to have truly interesting and enlightening experiences with the UFO phenomenon. It led me to believe that there may be some good ones and some bad ones. Either that, or they don't all come from outer space. So maybe goblins coming from an extra-dimensional realm beneath us. No idea, really. I'm just relating what happened. The story goes on, even up until the present day. Would you believe me if I said I have trouble keeping ordinary jobs? I have a difficult time relating to normal people. I'm always far out and crazy, and nobody understands. I wonder why. Is it possible that I may be one of them? I am a reasonably social person. Four years ago, I was living in Pittsburgh and decided to bike to D.C. about 350 kilometers. There is a trail that goes and is fairly fast from civilization, especially in the West Virginia, Maryland stretch. It's a known route a lot of people do often. However, normally you'd go in a group and do it in four, six days. I went alone and was done in three. This meant leaving before sunrise and finishing after sunset every day pedaling to no end and having no one to talk to. By the end of day two, I started hearing voices. Not random amorphous voices you normally have in your head. Voices belonging to specific people in my life. 
They were saying things consistent with those people's personalities, and we had long conversations about a whole host of things. Most interestingly, I was aware that this was all happening in my head the entire time, but had no way to turn it off. It all went away once I had a good night's sleep and a real meal, but it was a very interesting experience. I imagine this is what schizophrenia feels like, minus the awareness that the voices are not real. It was a wild night, one that I'll never forget. The date was September 1, 2020. I live in Naperville, Illinois. I was headed back home on a public bus. I believe it was a pace, and I was pretty much alone. Just me and the bus driver and one or two other people. That in and of itself was strange, but I'm not sure that was related. Anyways, I board the bus, and the bus driver is stopping off at plenty of locations. We arrive at one where there's little to no light around it. No street lamps, no houses or buildings, no nothing. The only thing illuminating the scene was the dim light inside the bus and the headlights. The bus driver opened the doors and nobody budges, but as the bus driver began to close the doors, we heard these really heavy footsteps come out of nowhere. Then I heard the most god-awful sound I have ever heard. It wasn't quite screaming, it wasn't singing, but it sounded angry. The bus driver began to open the doors again for the thing to the board. But as soon as it came into eyesight, nobody wanted that. That thing, to board this bus. The driver shut the doors as quickly as he could, and this creature became infuriated. It was wearing women's clothing, an orange shirt, and an orange hat with some shorts. It had been hot here. But that thing was not like any woman I've ever seen. I don't even know how to describe it. It could have the power to shapeshift if that's a thing. This thing, it was a she, or at least wanted to appear so, began pounding on the bus doors, howling its angry, screaming song. It went on for a long time. The bus driver was clearly in shock and confused and downright scared, as he should be. Hell, I was scared too. I don't think any of us knew what to do. And at the same time, we weren't sure if this thing would follow us. If we did let the creature in, would it harm us? Kill us even? Would it chase after us if we didn't? If we called the police and it left, would they even believe us? It wasn't any kind of cryptid like Bigfoot or the Chupacabra. Was it an extraterrestrial life form? It is an experience I will not forget ever in my life. The first thing I did when I arrived home was look up anything similar to no avail. So after these three years, I decided to report it. I know that you have been involved with the Chicago Mothman sightings investigation, but is it possible that this thing is related? It happened again late one night in September 2018. I live in Northeast Pennsylvania. I've been an experiencer for most of my life. They made no attempt to show up quietly either. There was an electrical storm, and I've seen craft hanging around those. So when one of these storms with no rain was hanging out directly over the house for a while, I knew they were coming. They took out the lights first, and I tried not to be scared. I'm tired of being scared, so I asked how to make the fear go away. I tried to go about my evening routine. Then there was some sort of hissing at the front door. Was I imagining it? No, that is definitely for me. So I got mad. You have to honor free will. You can't take me against my will, I repeated many times. Now though, I think this was my opportunity to cooperate had I let them in. I wish I had the courage to do this so I could learn what they're doing. The hissing stopped when I refused to open the door. Storm got angrier, so I went to bed. I kept repeating variations of the free will thing for a while, not happy that they clearly had other plans. Then I called my sister to attempt to wait them out, talked with her for a while, then tried to go to sleep, since by now the power was back. I told them I need my alarm for work, thought they might move on, still wide awake, but I can't sleep. My cat starts weirdly slinking off the bed like he's stalking something in the corner of the room, but very slowly. 
so I sit up to see what he's watching. The blue light from one of their freaking wands blinks off. I could see it under the door when I sat up. The cat calmed down and returned to his spot. Apparently, they don't just control us in our sleep. I called my sister again. Now I'm really upset. She tells me to come over. It's too late, even if I wanted to. They are determined, so I resign myself to my fate and go to sleep. I have to get up in four hours by now. They must be trying to take my soul again like they did the only other time I remember seeing the stick with the blue diode at the end, because I had a brief out-of-body experience. The last time I saw it, one of the few times I remember anything at all, they were trying to teach us how to leave our bodies. But by teach I mean they rip you out forcefully to get you used to the feeling. Empathy is not a thing the gray being have I guess. But I don't think it's them. I think what runs the show are the reptilians. I sat up in bed from sudden pain, it shocked me awake. But then the pain from my arm falling asleep in my body pulled at my soul, and my actual body sat up to absorb the soul. I watched myself sit up into myself. Kind of cool. Then they knocked me out I guess because I was out immediately afterward. I had personal enlightenment recently where I felt the fire of the chakra alignment send this new energy up my spine. It's a more intense ability to connect to the universe I haven't had before. I can literally feel it now when I tap in to talk to the universe. It's like tingles up my vertebrae. I have a very strong feeling their sudden intensity was because of this. They've never been so obvious before. Clearly, I needed to be studied immediately. But they don't want the body, they only want the soul. Them and that damn stick. I think I might have a soul contract with them I need to figure out how to get out of. I had a hypnotic regression done a few weeks after that incident. It was very disappointing because my questions were not answered. The encounters have been less severe since then. I'm just hoping that it eventually stops. This incident happened to my grandparents. I'm from Puerto Rico and my grandparents are fully Puerto Rican. Anyway to the story. It was the mid-1960s. My grandma was about 25 and my grandpa was about 20. My grandpa returned from the war in Vietnam and my grandparents moved to a small town on the outskirts of Marica, Puerto Rico. Another small town, but slightly bigger. It was a warm night. I'm not sure what time it was because they don't remember, but they know it was about midnight. They saw a light on top of a mountain. Let me explain Maricao. It is a very mountainous region. People that are not familiar with Puerto Rico don't know that Puerto Rico is a really mountainous region. The light was on top of a mountain, but my grandpa thought it was a fisherman because fishermen usually fish at night in the region. The thing is there was no source of water near the mountain, so my grandfather found that weird. Anyway, he kept staring at the light. The light was starting to approach them. It arrived in their front yard about ten yards in front of them, and it stayed there as if the thing was watching them. My grandpa is literally scared of nothing. He's encountered ghosts and the paranormal before, and never even had a drop of fear in all of the experiences. He saw a figure in the craft. The craft was about the size of a medium-sized SUV, except it was a shape of an oval. My brave grandpa got a flashlight and seriously walked toward the craft. He turned on the flashlight, the craft left quickly. It looked like disappeared, except when he looked at the sky he could see the craft exiting the Earth's atmosphere. After that, he never experienced a UFO sighting, even though he had a lot of paranormal experiences afterward. He believed that the other experiences were somehow related to his encounter with the UFO. So yesterday I was in the Colosseum in Italy. I was on a flyby visit to Rome as I wanted a few days to have a break. I didn't book a ticket in advance and managed to get an entrance ticket without a tour. So I was walking around by myself with the usual number of tourists running around, taking photos and chatting away. 
Anyway, I was pretty excited as I've always wanted to see Rome. I was walking up the stairs to the first floor of the Colosseum when I suddenly felt strange, like I was flooded with fear. It was like I was sensing the fear of something else. I knew that the thing I sensed was not only afraid, but knew when it was about to die. It could smell blood and death as it was being let out. The feeling of fear was also tinged with confusion. As I walked up the stairs, the feeling got stronger. I then felt that it was trying to say that its bones were still here. I knew it wasn't human. Now, I don't usually feel things like this. I've never felt like I am psychic or anything like that. I'm quite pragmatic, and though I've had weird things happen, it's never been a feeling like this exactly. I also know that the first floor was for spectators, not for anything or anyone who was about to die. So my feeling did not make any logical sense. I was willing to dismiss what I was feeling, and though maybe I'd had too much sun. I got to the top of the stairs and walked around the first exhibition I see where the bones of animals that had been discovered after having been killed in the Colosseum. The feeling got stronger and then just disappeared. I didn't feel anything like that for the rest of my visit. Now I'm home and I can't help but reflect back on those moments. Was it a frightened animal who had died a painful and confusing death, stuck there for millennia and randomly choosing to reach out? Or did I just lose my mind for a moment? I honestly can't shake the feeling and it's left me unsettled. Has anyone else had a similar experience there or elsewhere? On another note, always book month in advance for a tour to the Colosseum. You can get much better tours than what I got by just turning up. It was a sunny summer afternoon when my friends and I decided to go fishing on the Saskatchewan River in the beautiful province of Saskatchewan, Canada. Little did we know that our outing would turn into an unforgettable encounter with the Sasquatch. As we set up our fishing gear and cast our lines into the calm waters, laughter and excitement filled the air. We joked and shared stories, unaware of the extraordinary event that was about to unfold. It started innocently enough, with strange rustling noises coming from the dense forest surrounding us. At first, we dismissed it as the wind playing tricks on our ears, or perhaps an animal lurking nearby. But as the rustling persisted and grew louder, we couldn't help but feel a sense of unease creeping into our hearts. Suddenly, a towering figure emerged from the trees, capturing our attention like nothing else before. At first glance, we thought it must be some kind of prank. Maybe one of our friends was playing a joke on us, dressed up in a costume to scare us. But as we looked closer, our jaws dropped in disbelief. Before us stood an actual Sasquatch, or Bigfoot as some call it. Its massive frame towered over us, covered in shaggy brown hair. Its muscular arms hung down by its sides, and its eyes seemed to hold a mysterious wisdom. We were dumbfounded, frozen in both awe and fear. It was as if time stood still, and all we could do was stare at this creature of legend. The Sasquatch seemed curious about us as well. It observed us with a mixture of caution and intrigue. We could see its intelligent eyes scanning our group, assessing whether we posed a threat. It seemed almost human-like, yet undeniably otherworldly. As the initial shock wore off, a wave of excitement and fascination swept over us. We fumbled for our cameras, eager to capture this extraordinary moment on film. But as we fumbled with our devices, the Sasquatch, sensing our intentions, vanished back into the depths of the forest, leaving us in a state of disbelief. We spent the rest of the day recounting the encounter over and over, dissecting every detail and questioning our own sanity. Had we truly come face to face with a legendary creature? Our fishing trip had transformed into a surreal adventure, forever etched in our memories. News of our encounter spread like wildfire, sparking both skepticism and intrigue among the locals. Some dismissed our story as a wild fabrication, while others were filled with curiosity and wonder. Regardless of the skepticism, our group knew the truth. 
We had experienced something truly extraordinary on that fateful day along the Saskatchewan River. From that moment on, our lives were forever changed. We became avid researchers of the unexplained, delving into the mysteries of the Sasquatch phenomenon. Our encounter with the legendary creature became the catalyst for a lifelong pursuit of truth and exploration. To this day, we hold on to that memory, cherishing the shared bond we have as witnesses to the enigmatic presence of the Sasquatch. Our fishing trip turned into an extraordinary adventure, connecting us with a world beyond our own, where legends come to life. And though skeptics may scoff, we know in our hearts that we were privileged to have a glimpse into the elusive world of the Sasquatch on that fateful day along the Saskatchewan River. Back in college, when I was 19, I went to an art opening on campus. I'd never been in this particular building before. I was just inside the front door in the main lobby. In front of me was the entrance to the gallery space, and to my left is a short hallway that led to the men's and women's bathrooms. The lobby was full of people chatting when someone got everyone's attention to talk about the exhibit. Since I was near the entrance, I was in the back of the crowd while everyone has turned to listen. While the speaker was talking, I saw someone come from the hallway, presumably from the bathroom. It was a man, and I was struck by how much he looks like me except 15-20 years older. He was not listening to the speaker, but stood at the entrance to the hallway, and was looking directly at me with giddy grin on his face. He stared for a few seconds, then quickly went back down the hallway toward the bathroom. I was perplexed and kept watching for him to come back out. When the speaker ended, everyone went into the main gallery space expect me. I went to the bathroom to get another look at this person. The bathroom was empty, and there wasn't another door besides the women's room. I've thought about this event a lot since it happened, and always wondered if I'd time travel someday, but now I'm probably older than the person I saw. My memory of what he looked like has degraded as I've thought about this experience, so I can't say if I now look like the man I saw then. Who was this person? Why did they look at me? Where did they go? I remember that day in Croatia like it was yesterday, although it's been years since that eerie reconnaissance mission on the deserted island. We were a Navy SEAL squad, sent on a classified operation to gather intel about maritime Navy activity in the region. Little did we know, we were about to stumble upon something that defied all logic and challenged our perception of reality. The island was rugged and desolate, overgrown with thick vegetation and surrounded by an ominous mist that seemed to hang in the air like a shroud. Our mission was simple. Infiltrate, gather intel and exfiltrate without leaving a trace. Easy, or so we thought. As we trekked deeper into the heart of the island, we began to notice strange markings and symbols etched into the trees and rocks. They were unlike anything we had ever seen, and an unease began to settle over the team. We pressed on, our senses heightened, and our instincts on high alert. And then we saw it. The creature, if you could even call it that, emerged from the dense foliage. It was a hulking mass of hair and muscle, standing nearly eight feet tall. Its overlong arms hung nearly to its feet, each finger ending in an eight-inch claw that jutted out like deadly talons. It was covered in a sheen of silver-like hair, and its feet, human-like but monstrous in size, left enormous imprints in the earth. But what truly rattled us to our core was its head. It resembled more that of a grizzly bear, with a shorter but deeply scarred snout. Those scars alluded to untold battles with beings even larger than itself, battles that it had somehow survived. Still, though, emanating through that horrific exterior were those piercing blue eyes, eyes that seemed to project a sense of ancient experience, as if they had witnessed the rise and fall of civilizations. Before any of us could react, the creature lunged at us, its claws outstretched and its teeth bared in a guttural growl. Panic set in, and we opened fire with a barrage of bullets. 
The deafening roar of our weapons filled the air as we poured rounds into the monstrosity before us. The creature howled in pain but refused to fall. In a final desperate act, it turned and leaped with unnatural strength into the sea, disappearing beneath the surface without a trace. The water churned and frothed where it had been, but the creature was gone. We were left standing there, our weapons still trained on the water, our hearts pounding in our chests. The mission had been a success. We had retrieved the classified documents we came for. But as we made our way back to the extraction point, the weight of what we had witnessed began to sink in. Back on the extraction chopper, none of us spoke a word. The image of that creature, with its impossible anatomy and ancient eyes, was seared into our minds. We had faced countless dangers in our line of work, but this was something entirely different, something beyond our comprehension. As we returned to base, we couldn't help but wonder what we had stumbled upon that day. What was that creature, and where had it come from? We may never have answers to those questions, but one thing was for certain. The line between reality and the unknown had blurred that day on the deserted island in Croatia, and it left us all questioning the boundaries of what we thought we knew. I swear to you, what I'm about to share is a true story. I work at NASA, and for obvious reasons I need to remain anonymous. Let's just call me Randy, after the legendary guitarist Randy Rhodes. I've always been drawn to the mysteries of the universe, and little did I know that one fateful day, my life would take a mind-boggling turn. It was during a routine space mission, monitoring the vastness of space from the control room, when something extraordinary happened. As I gazed at the screens displaying data from distant planets, my eyes widened in disbelief. There, amidst the black void, appeared an object that defied explanation. At first, I thought it was a computer glitch, but curiosity got the better of me, and I couldn't resist investigating further. As I zoomed in on the object using the cameras, my heart skipped a beat. It was no trick of the light or fabrication. Right before my eyes, the object revealed itself to be a highly advanced extraterrestrial spacecraft. Words fail me as I attempt to describe its appearance. The craft had a sleek, metallic exterior with a silvery sheen that seemed to shimmer in the distant starlight. Its shape was unlike anything I had ever seen, a combination of smooth curves and sharp angles that defied conventional aerodynamics. Mysterious symbols adorned its surface, symbols that were alien to any known language. Fighting the urge to panic, I knew I had to document this unprecedented encounter. I grabbed my camera and snapped as many photographs of the UFO as I could. Every detail was essential. I watched in awe as the craft maneuvered effortlessly through the cosmos, defying our understanding of propulsion systems. There were no visible rockets, no conventional means of propulsion. It simply glided through space, defying the laws of physics. Just as I thought the encounter couldn't get any more bewildering, the unimaginable happened. In an instant, the craft vanished before my eyes, as if it had never been there. I was left dumbfounded, my mind racing to comprehend the enormity of what I had witnessed. Filled with a mix of awe, disbelief, and a hint of fear, I immediately contacted my supervisor. Trembling, I recounted the entire encounter, from the initial sighting to the abrupt disappearance of the UFO. The gravity of the situation was palpable as my supervisor arrived, his expression a mixture of concern and secrecy. As he examined the photographs I had taken, he urged me to keep this encounter strictly confidential. He emphasized the potential impact on the public, the fear and chaos it could incite. I was instructed not to share my experience with anyone, not even my closest colleagues. My discovery was to remain hidden from the world. Still reeling from the surreal events of the day, I returned home, my mind swirling with questions and uncertainties. I couldn't shake the feeling that the truth needed to be revealed, that humanity deserved to know. Fueled by a sense of responsibility, I decided to take matters into my own hands, and that's why I'm here sharing my account with you. 
Anonymity provides a shield of protection, allowing me to reveal the truth without risking my career or the stability of society. This story must be told, and it's up to those who hear it to decide what to make of it. Remember, this is not fiction. This is my first-hand experience, and it has forever changed my perception of the cosmos. This is one of the craziest yet creepiest experiences I had. So, I've been a pretty avid hiker and backpacker all my life. I live in North Carolina and often drive west toward the mountains to find places to explore. But on this particular adventure, I just picked a random forest far enough from any major cities and towns that I could see the stars well enough without light pollution. It was a fairly uneventful day and I was setting up camp near a small creek for the night, had my fire going, and was about to eat when I heard something coming toward me directly in front of me. I pulled out my nine mem I always bring just in case and waited. An older man walks into the firelight, he has a smile on his face and was wearing an old farmer's hat, red button-up shirt and jeans. He put his hands up saying he meant no harm and was just wondering who was out in the middle of nowhere. I was hesitant keeping my gun at the ready but relaxed a little. Me and the old guy start to have a pretty interesting conversation as he sits across from me. Eventually he told me his name was Louise but asked me to call him Lou. So me and Lou talk well into the night, sharing stories and laughing a lot of it, was about his life and family who he said he doesn't see anymore seeing, he lived out in the middle of nowhere. It was honestly one of the most enjoyable conversations I've had with another human being in my life. Maybe around 3am I tell him I'm going to go to sleep and he agrees, but before I went in my tent he stopped me, having come up to me with his hand on my shoulder, and let me tell you his touch was cold as ice. What he said I've never forgotten, he said. Thank you for this, it's so nice to be able to talk to someone after so long. I kind of smiled despite my skin crawling under his touch, and told him he seemed like a good man, and he should go see his family, that I'm sure they missed him as much as he did. He sort of sniffled and nodded and asked if it was alright if he slept out by the fire, and I agreed stupid, I know. So I go to bed, and the next morning Lou was gone. I don't think much of it and pack my stuff and head in the direction he came from the night before. About 100 yards or so from where I was camped, I found a decrepit cabin. My gut told me to go check it out so I slip inside, and that's when I see something that changed my outlook on life and death. Sitting in an old rocking chair was some skeletal remains, bits of cloth that were cloths still sticking to it. It took a minute, but then I noticed the almost perfect old farmer's hat perched on the chair and the pieces of red cloth sticking to the remains. I sort of just walked out after that I was numb in shock I guess. Next thing I knew I was unlocking the door to my car and driving home. I don't know what I saw that night, but I can say I do believe in ghosts, now though part of me wants to believe I helped him somehow. I've been back to that forest, but I could never find that cabin again. Honestly, I just hope wherever Lou is he is happy and with his family. I know this ended kind of sappy, but I figured it pretty creepy enough to qualify. When I was around 1718, some friends invited me to a hunting, fishing, or camping kind of thing. I rarely went so far north in my country, so I agreed despite not having anything to do with this kind of stuff. I feel like I have to say I'm from Moldova, Eastern Europe. Those woods connect with Romania and Ukraine, at least they did back in the day, I'm 28 now. A huge forest, even experienced hunters get lost sometimes. I also have to add that our hunters don't have trails made specifically for them. No trail, no camps made for tourists or hunters, not nothing. It's pure mother nature and you. We do have tourist spots, but they never go really far. We must have walked two, three hours before we even found the spot. We camped there and after a while we went deeper. After four hours we picked up signs that there is a boar somewhere. We went after it and even split when someone saw fox signs around. 
I went with three others after the fox. We went towards and I even saw from afar, but something scared it and it went in a different location very fast. We also noticed some movement. The location is higher than us, and for some reason we decided to go there. At first we thought it's other hunters, but soon enough we understood it's something else. We found the spot, but no one was there, blood all over the place. I never thought things like that happen in real life. Five meters around splashes of blood. Some stains even led further from the spot. I was enchanted by it and wanted to go after it, but then my friend stopped me. The most experienced one said to go back slowly, and he even took his gun in his hand. He usually kept it at his thigh, not the hunting rifle. I got scared very fast because obviously it was not right. But that was nothing because then I saw a human hand ripped in pieces, mauled by big teeth. I noticed how my friend would look around and knowing him I knew someone is watching. We went back very fast and the guys circled me for protection. I think the fact that my badass friends were so protective of me raised the biggest red flags for me because they're usually not this way. We tried to call the others but no signal and one of my friends made a fire with smoke. One hour passed and nothing. I knew they had to fire a couple of times in the air to signal them, but somehow they were afraid to do it because according to my friend, someone else could know where we are. Another friend replied, too late for that, they are close. At this point I started to laugh because I thought they are pranking me until I heard something in the direction where we came from. They never explained anything to me, but from what I understood when they talked to each other, there was this vicious and smart pack of wolves that come from the mountains, either Romania or Ukraine. Deforestation is a real problem in those countries, especially Romania so many wild animals that disappeared in our country started to appear recently. They encountered this pack a while ago, but thought they went back or scared them off. But apparently, they came back to the place where my friends usually gathered. The thing is, they're not afraid of firearms like common wolves in my country are. So, basically, we couldn't reach our friends and according to the friends I was with, the pack went after them after tracking us. This is still illogical to me, but it was logically for them, so who am I to question them? This pack also attacks people, hungry or not, and even hunt people much more often than other animals. Last time they met the pack, they went after them for 50 kilometer until they reached their destination near water. They used their firearms on them, but nothing helped. Two of my friends decided to go after the others and warn them about the pack. Me and the friend that stayed left almost everything in the camp and basically went back home. My two friends also took a bare minimum and ran. It was midnight and still, no sign of my friends, not even a signal. The friend that was with me couldn't handle the pressure and equipped himself with grenades and army clothes and went to the camp in case if any of them came back. Later that night I saw his signaling fire at the camp. I tried to stay occupied and started to clean up when I hear howling very close. I looked at the window that faces the forest and nothing. Then after the second howling, I realized they're near the house. Somehow they managed to jump the fence and they actually circled the house. They were walking in the circle. Someone called and I have to say, I was never so scared and happy in my entire life. Scared because I jumped when it rang. One of my friends were practically screaming in the phone to go in the basement and release the puppy. To say that I'm shocked is to say nothing. I couldn't understand a lot of things he said, because the signal was bad. Also because he was screaming, they knew the pack is at the house, and they were coming, but for some reason, I had to go in the basement to get some puppy. Honestly, I think, subconsciously I knew what was going on, but at the time I was too scared to think. I found a baby wolf in the basement. My genius friends thought it's a good idea to bring in their house, the baby of the wolf pack that killed people. I was never more angry at them than that time, and they have done stupid things before. The problem was that if I opened the door at the basement to release the puppy, the wolves could get me. So I decided to take it to the second floor, 
and put in a basket or something and gently put it on the ground with a rope. I found everything I needed when I heard scratches on the door. The wolf mama wanted to get in and honestly, if she knew how old the house is, she would just probably put her weight on the door and then she would easily come inside. I went to the balcony and slowly started to get the basket down. The wolves were there, looking at me in all my moves. The she-wolf was easy to spot. She ran towards the puppy. I have to stay the reunion was touching, but the wolves were only happy for five seconds. One of them even tried to jump at me. I was hypnotized. I watched them take the puppy and going where they came from. The she-wolf took the puppy in the teeth and jumped the fence. The rest of them jumped too, except one. He must have been the oldest, he had very smart eyes. He looked at me for a long time before he jumped too. I was scared and fascinated and a couple of times when he went into the forest, he would look back and honestly, it was the greatest thing ever. My friends came back a couple of hours after that, worried about me, but I told everything and they were also shocked to hear about the behavior of these wolves, except one, the brother of the thief who took the puppy. He punched him right in the jaw and broke it. They didn't speak a couple of years after that. In the forest, they barely survived the pack. The only thing that saved them was the smelly bomb the brother had, not before he was bitten a couple of times. Other friends were attacked too until the two friends that were with me came to their rescue with fire. I know the story is incredible and many will say it's fake, but God admit it's the best story of my life and I don't care if people believe me. No one can take that from me. Also, I think since I don't know the whole story and many details, the story seems unreal. But I bet if one of my friends would tell it would seem more real. So this happened years ago, easily seven plus. I was hanging out late night or early morning with this chick I had been talking to. Throughout the night, we had been enjoying the night sky looking at the moon which was very high in the sky, and just overall enjoying a beautiful summer night. It was around 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and she decided to walk home, leaving me alone to smoke a cigarette before I left myself. As I smoked, I looked up at the eastern horizon and just above the horizon line, I noticed what looked like a very dim, more dark planet. It was larger than the moon, probably 1.5 by the size of the moon that I could still visibly see much higher in the sky. This dim dark planet was moving very fast as the sun and moon also do when rising or setting. It rose rapidly and disappeared in the darkness of the night sky. What could this have been? I don't think it was image refraction in the atmosphere, as the moon was so far away from this planet's position in the sky and it was too early for the sun to even be close enough to cause anything like this to occur. I'm very curious to hear ideas on what this could have been. I like to explain things logically, and most things can be explained by everyday stuff. For example, someone says that there's a ghostly knocking in their home. They're terrified of it, and it ends up being a loose pipe that knocks when the water is turned on and off. I have one of these pipes in my home. It's loud. So with that out of the way, I would like to share. This just happened to me about 10 minutes ago or less, and I'm confused and slightly alarmed. I was getting ready for bed, and I like to sit and play on my phone before bed. The lights are all on, and I'm just sitting on my side with my phone in my hand. My boyfriend isn't there at the moment he was in the bathroom, so I'm sitting there and all of the sudden I see a bright yet small and focused beam of light coming from seemingly under his pillow at an angle coming towards me. I wasn't scared of it. It's a light. I have many items that create light. Headphones, his watch, my phone, and more. So I'm thinking, oh he must have forgot his watch in bed and it made a weird light flash for a notification. Big problem though, there's nothing under the pillow. I lifted it up and looked carefully as to not knock the thing out of the bed, whatever it may have been, and there's nothing. So I'm like, okay, maybe it rolled away and I keep searching. 
I can't find the object or a source of this beam. The flash was only for a second. A full second. It wasn't super short, but it wasn't so fast that I could blame it on me imagining it. I was looking right at it, man. I saw the beam clear as day. It was so clear that I thought I must have left something in the bed, or maybe my boyfriend did. Clear as day. Right in front of my eyes. I couldn't find a source. I removed all the pillows and felt around. There's nothing. My headphones are not in the bed. My boyfriend's watch is in the other room. My phone was in my hand. His phone was on the floor charging. WTF. I told him and he was chill about it and is now sleeping directly on the spot where the ghost light was so that makes one of us chill with it. I'm not scared of it. Maybe I am, but I'm more curious and want to get to the bottom of this. I don't know anymore, guys. It was right in front of me clear as day. I don't know. It came from under the pillow and there's nothing there. There is a 900 plus acre farm, ranch that I hunt 10 to 15 minutes outside of Big Rapids, Michigan College Town, about 25,000 residents. I've known for years about the existence of Sasquatch. I have been an avid archery hunter for years and loved spending hours in the woods, scouting and setting up new stands to hunt in the fall. On occasions, my sixth sense would go into overdrive while out scouting certain sections of this property. I would dismiss it as an overactive imagination and carry on with my mission. Multiple times while on stand I would hear loud tree knocks from various points that surrounded me. I never thought too much into them as I would just dismiss those as natural sounds due to limbs clanking, banging, or busting. I would also notice rank and stagnant odors that would overwhelm my area from time to time. Again, I'd also dismiss these foul smells as possible black bear odors as I've heard they stink and are quite abundant in our area. On one occasion, while walking into my stand, I heard what sounded like a rock skipping through the treetops, hitting up high and falling to the ground. I glanced in the general direction of the sound and didn't see anything. As I continued walking, I heard the same sound again, that this time it was closer and as I looked towards the sound, I caught the movement of a two to three inch diameter rock falling out of the tree in which it had just impacted. I walked up to the rock, picked it up and stared up the tree, saying to myself, what the hell are the squirrels carrying these big rocks up the trees? You see the pattern here. Weird happens and I dismiss it as I'm 45 years young and don't want to believe I have to deal with a Sasquatch or any other paranormal entity on the land on which I hunt. But the last incident finally got my attention, and I now acknowledge the fact that I could possibly be dealing with one of these beings. My son and I were heading out of the woods in a well-lit full moon night about an hour after dark. No flashlights needed. We had a one-half-mile walk back to our vehicle up this easily traversable stretch bottom that laid at the foot of large rolling hardwood hills and deep cutting ravines that extended to the creek's edge. We had sat pretty close in proximity to one another and had met up at dark to walk out together. Keep in mind that this is the same area that I've experienced tree knocks, rocks being thrown, and smells that could curl your toenails. We had covered the half-mile hike back to our origins, and were now standing outside of our vehicle offloading our gear into the back seat. I reached into the car and fired the engine while still standing outside of it as to shed some ambient light on our surrounding. I turned my back to the car, it was in the process of evacuating my bladder, when I heard what I thought was my son cranking the radio up in the car as loud as he could. I wheeled my head over to my over my shoulders to look at him, and when I did I locked eyes with my son who stood on the other side of the car. I saw the fear in his eyes as he stood with his jaw open wide. He had not entered the car and turned up the radio. It was a scream, yell that had radiated from the bottom of which we had just exited minutes before. The loud bellowing lasted 10 or 15 seconds, and was as loud as any music concert I've ever attended. Keep in mind, I'm 6 foot, 230 pounds. My son's 6 foot 2 and about 260. 
We're both armed with bows and knives, and I had a 45 XDS Springfield on my side. My son and I jumped into the car, slammed the door shut, and peeled out like Bo and Luke Duke being chased by Roscoe P. Coltrane and Boss Hog as dirt flew from our tires all the way out to the paved road. Normally we travel this half-dirt two-track at about 10 miles per hour. That night we may or may not have hit 50 miles per hour. We anxiously and excitedly talked about our experience together all the way back home. We've spent hundreds upon hundreds of hours in the woods and have hunted almost everything possible to hunt in our area. We have never heard any form of vocalization like this before. We rarely hunt this property anymore and never alone. As a matter of fact, the last time I sat in this area was two rifle seasons ago, and I heard a larger tree fall over on a windless afternoon. I retreated back to the truck and basically called it quits for the day. I believe my husband and I saw a hellhound. We live in rural northern Idaho and we both hunt. So we know everything about animals, even in pitch darkness. We don't have regular plumbing. We have to turn on an electric well every morning to fill it up. Our tank can last us three to four days, but we like it filled, just in case. There are other tanks like that scattered in the woods, just waiting for someone to buy the land and build a home. We were taking a walk and it got dark, so we went back home. However, on our way home, we saw something, not human or animal, near one of the wells. It was hunched over like it was eating. We walked carefully closer, about 20 feet from this thing, trying to figure out what it is. Too large for a stray dog or wolf and too small for a bear. But whatever it was, it looked at us with red eyes. I've never been more scared in my life. My husband is scared of nothing, and he was scared too. We took off running. My god, we never ran so fast in our lives. It did chase for a while, then it just disappeared. We got to our house, and it was just gone. We knew it was behind us when we left the woods, but we couldn't see it. We locked all the windows and doors that night. We talked to one of the town locals about the thing we saw. He showed us a picture of a hellhound. He told us stories about people meeting the hellhound in the same area, always near a well, roads, crossroads, or places of death. Seeing him once will bring us happiness, seeing him twice will bring us sorrow, and seeing him three times will bring us an end. I don't know what we saw, but hellhound is the only explanation. I work for a city park and recreation department here in Colorado. I also serve as a district ranger for the National Park Service. I took the ranger patrolling training and love the outdoors, but I'm not a trained scientist or a tracker. I was driving home from work one evening in 2017, and it was dusk. I was heading east on US-24 towards Berthout Falls. There is a turnoff located before you get right to the falls that goes to a park where you can camp called Rainbow Park. I was driving down the turnoff, and when I reached the bottom of the road, I saw this huge thing looking at me. I wasn't sure what it was at first, but I really thought it was a bear. But then I saw wings and saw that this might be some sort of mountain lion creature with wings, at least that's what it looked like. So I'm thinking it's a flying mountain lion, totally confused because my brain cannot process this. It does not make any sense. Then it jumps off the ground and takes off into the air. Not only was this amazing to see, but it was also mind-numbing. It was huge and had a very large body and a wingspan far larger than my truck. The body was more like a mix between a human and a lion, and the head looked more like a large cat. I thought maybe it was injured, or I'm not sure what it was doing. I could see, though, that its wings were very strange, also very alien looking to any kind of bird we have here on Earth. I mean, these are just my guesses. I took off into the woods, drove up the road to the park, got out of my truck, still shocked at my sighting, and everything around me was dead silent. I noticed right away it was colder than usual, and things did not feel right. I had a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. 
I just tried to shake it off as best I could, and things seemed to stop for the time being. Later on, I went back to the spot where I had my sighting, and there were huge impressions on the ground where it landed, going through the trees into the woods. I was so confused but also scared and in awe. I've kept this a secret until now. I would love to tell everybody more about what I saw and where. I wish I could have taken photos, but it all happened so fast. As scared as I was, it honestly kind of reminded me of seeing something from Greek mythology come to life or something along those lines. I don't know what creature looks like that with wings, but man, it was something else entirely. Thank you for taking the time to read this. My name is Tom. Of course, that's not my real name, but the name for the sake of story. I was leader of the Navy SEAL team, so we were deployed to a war-torn region of Iraq with a classified mission to eliminate a high-value target terrorist leader, not Saddam. Little did we know that our encounter with the enemy would take a terrifying turn. After meticulous planning and precise execution, we successfully infiltrated the target's heavily guarded castle. Using advanced surveillance equipment, we kept a constant eye on the live feed, ensuring that our actions were being monitored by the highest authority. With the utmost precision, we eliminated the target, fulfilling our mission objective. As the cameras captured the moment, we knew our success would be witnessed by the eyes of our nation's leaders. As the mission came to a close, we shut off the camera feed and began securing the area. Curiosity overcame me, and a strange pull drew me towards a dark and hidden basement chamber within this desert castle. With each step, an eerie silence filled the air, adding to the weight of the unknown that awaited me. As I entered the chamber, a dim light revealed and strange sight that froze me in awe. Before me stood a creature, towering at least ten feet tall, its form shrouded in shadow. It possessed a humanoid shape with two long and skinny legs, arms that extended all the way to the ground, and a round body. Its neck, elongated and slender, held no features of a face. Around him were human corpses, about ten of poor people. The air grew thick with a sense of malevolence, and I could feel the creature's presence suffocating me. Without warning, it lunged at me with blinding speed and brute force. The impact sent me crashing to the ground, my senses reeling from the ferocity of the attack. In the chaos of the moment, the creature vanished as swiftly as it had appeared, leaving me shaken and bewildered. Desperately, I called for backup, summoning my fellow seal stow the scene. But as they arrived, confusion etched on their faces, they claimed they hadn't witnessed any creature or encountered anything out of the ordinary. Doubt clouded their expressions, and their responses only deepened the mystery. We combed the area, searching every nook and cranny, but there was no trace of the creature that had assaulted me. It was as if it had vanished into thin air, leaving behind only lingering questions and a chilling sense of unease. Despite the lack of evidence, I knew in my bones that what I had witnessed was real, a terrifying encounter with an entity beyond comprehension. I was a beat officer for a small town in northern New Jersey. The chief of police at the time was a guy well known to me and my brothers in the force as Mr. Paranoid himself. One night, I responded to a call from dispatch that there had been reports of screaming from the woods near Greenwood Lake. I arrived at the location and didn't see anything but a foul smell hung in the air. It smelled like blood, wet dog, and iron. I entered the woods on foot with my flashlight ready to catch any pranksters or anybody who was fooling around. Listening intently for any sign of life, as I made my way deeper into the woods, Something suddenly darted out from a clump of trees to my right, tearing off into the woods. I chased after them, or it as best I could, but there's no way I could ever catch up to them. A few weeks later, a young boy had gone missing from his family's campsite around the same location. The search party had come up empty-handed, but I knew that area was where I had seen whatever it was that night, what I assumed was a large animal. 
The chief of police, during an investigation, took me aside and told me not to talk about what I saw around town. He stated that he didn't want to cause panic in the small town, so he never reported his encounter or description of what happened at Greenwood. Though we weren't able to find any missing persons matching the description, we're also unable to find the location of where this other officer believed that he himself saw a werewolf. I did see one though, claiming to be an unnamed officer who had also been on the search party for the missing boy, but they have since been let go. I had an entertainment center advertised and a woman asked to come over to have a look at it. We set up a time and when the time came, she didn't show up. I texted her and a couple hours later she replied and asked if it was too late to come by. It was 10 p.m., but I said okay. She said she would be there in 10 minutes, but wasn't there 20 minutes later and I texted her again. 10 more minutes, she said, but she hadn't shown up by 11 p.m., so I texted again and said we would have to do it another day, and she replied that she was just pulling up. I go to my front door and sure enough she is pulling into the driveway, and there are about four or five other people in the car with her. They all get out and start walking towards the door, and I ask them what they are doing, and the woman says they all want to see the entertainment center. I tell her that only she can come in, and at that point I wasn't sure I even wanted her to come in. She says she needs at least one other person's opinion. I say no, she gets indignant and I ask her to leave, and she says that I am not being a very good Christian. I say I am fine with that and went in my house and locked all the doors, peeking out the window. One of the dudes who was with her is pissing at the end of my driveway, but then they get in the car and drive away. The whole thing was super bizarre. I was going to drive from DC to Charlotte, North Carolina alone. I figured, why not post in the rideshare section to get some company and gas money? A guy messages me saying that he's interested in joining me for the ride, but he lives in Richmond, Virginia. No problem. Richmond is on the way. I respond with some information about myself and my interests, seeing as though I'm planning to spend several hours with this guy. He replies asking if we can drop off a duffel bag in Petersburg, Virginia. It sounds a bit suspicious, but sure, I tell him, no problem. We're three days away from the day we're supposed to leave. He messages me saying that he's not sure if he can go anymore because he's still waiting to hear back from his probation officer. He then goes on telling me how much of a bitch she is for making him check in, and that he shouldn't even be required to notify her before he leaves the state of Virginia. I didn't reply. I was on a flight back from Thailand. We were flying to Detroit via Toronto. Well, a major storm had us stuck in Toronto for a day and a half. Every flight it seemed like we might leave then at the last second we wouldn't. I got to talking to a few people because we kept seeing each other for every possible flight out. Finally, I tell this guy I've been chatting with, Man F this, we're only a few hours from Detroit. I'm renting a car. He said, yeah, me too. I said, well, if you want to save money, we can just share a car. I could see from the look on his face that his butthole puckered hard enough to make diamonds. He no doubt thought I was bringing in drugs and would land him in prison for life. Obviously, we drove separately. He was sort of vindicated. For each possible flight, we had to go through customs each time which meant I had what looked like about six trips from us to Canada in two days with Thailand thrown in as well. You better believe they searched the living shit out of my car at the border like four hours of searching. When I female was 19, I was looking for a room to rent in the city I was moving to for college. It was about an hour away from my family. I wasn't having much luck and my mom started helping me look for a place. She found an ad on Craigslist for a room for $300 in a house, everything included. 
The homeowner was a man, and he rented the additional rooms upstairs to other women while he lived in the finished basement. The ad stated he rarely ever saw the other roommates because he had a kitchen and his own entrance downstairs, and that he preferred women because he had issues with male roommates in the past partying and causing damage. We decided to take a look since it was the cheapest that we could find in the area. My mom and I went to the house to view it. Decent house, decent neighborhood. He opened the door and was very welcoming. He was middle-aged and the kitchen and living room were furnished nicely and clean. My mom loves to talk and get to know people so they were engaged in conversation while I stood there quietly and observed the place. He then said he would show me my room. We head towards the staircase to go up, as I thought, since he said on the phone my room was upstairs with the other roommates, but he opens another door and we follow. He takes us down to the basement and opens a door to a very small room, no closet and no windows. He proceeds to say this is my room and I will be sharing the bathroom in the hallway with him, and his bedroom did not have a door on it. I was definitely thinking absolutely not this is weird but they were so deep in conversation that I couldn't interject. He then leads us to the upstairs and shows us the other rooms which the doors were open and says they are currently rented. He then starts telling us elaborate stories about the other women, not very nice stories describing drinking problems. My mom was listening intently, but I took the time to investigate further. I looked in all three rooms in the bathrooms. There was furniture but not a single item in there that looked like it belonged to a woman. No clothes or anything, only men's clothes in one of the closets. He had no problem with me creeping around his tenants' rooms without their permission. I then heard him tell my mom that he has some of his stuff in their closets, but they don't mind and I'm just like, um, why the hell would a tenant pay you for you to use their space as storage? I was feeling really uncomfortable and started moving them back downstairs as they talked. My mom had mentioned when we arrived that her and my dad were going on vacation the next week, but I couldn't go because I had to work. He brought it up again and that I should come by the next week and have dinner with him and the roomies to see if we would all get along. I said sure and we left. As soon as we got in the car, I told my mom I would definitely not be living there. She was dumbfounded. I had to explain to her not only did he lie about the room I would be in, that I was not supposed to be in the basement with him as well as share a bathroom with him, and he didn't even have a damn door, but also did she not notice how no one else even lived there. She still didn't get it and thought I was just being paranoid and thought he was nice and it was a cheap deal. I had to explain it to my stepdad and get him to tell. Her by no means would I be living there. I tried to report the post, but by the time we got home that day he removed it. I think he planned on murdering me at dinner, or abducting me and holding me hostage in that basement room that had no way to escape. I hope that guy hits a tree with his car one day. Edit. Some details have been coming back to me since I've been answering all of your questions. This happened in 2011, so it's been quite a while. When he took us upstairs, there was a wide landing that was surrounded by the rooms. As soon as we go up there, he motions towards one of the rooms and started this long, intricate story about the woman who lived in there and talking about her alcoholism and a crazy ex. He was very exaggerated in how he talked with a lot of gestures. My mom stood there listening to him. I don't know if it was sheer distraction or she didn't want to be rude not listening, but either way, I don't recall her ever having a good look around those rooms. I went and looked. All doors were open, had neatly made beds with dark wood bed frames, bureaus with mirrors and nightstands. There were sliding mirror closets, and they were empty except for one had men's clothes hanging pushed against one corner. Nothing was on the nightstands other than a lamp and nothing on the bureaus. I went into the bathrooms and there was nothing on the vanity in them other than hand soap. I looked in the showers too, but nothing other than bar soap. The bedroom on the left had an empty suitcase laying open on the middle of the bed. This was one of the rooms with the empty closet. After seeing all this, I came back onto the landing and started slowly heading down the stairs. 
They were still talking and absent-mindedly followed me down to the living room. That's when he mentioned dinner and we left shortly after. I think that's why my mom didn't notice a lot and didn't believe me at first. She didn't take more than a quick glance upstairs, and when we were in the basement he was just as as talkative. A commentator on here who works with law enforcement pointed out this was probably a sex trafficking situation. The bedroom in the basement is where a victim is kept, drugged and abused until broken and then trafficked. I honestly think this is more plausible with the situation as well as my city is actually a hot spot for that. I am so grateful we got out of there and I hope my experience could help someone one day notice the details and get out of the situation safely. Stay safe and blessed people. Could use a throwaway, but it's also not really a big deal. I thought I was bisexual for the longest time because I always had an interest in guys since high school. Not in any other way than I wanted to try giving head. Well, sure enough, I took to good old Craigslist to find a suitor for my request. Found a guy, texted, and he drove down and I met him in his car. Now it wasn't really anything but a simple transaction, just a blow and go type arrangement. But I realized as soon as I put it in my mouth that I was without a doubt 100% undeniably straight. The thing is, he didn't take too kindly to me not finishing him and said that he had put the child locks on the door and I wasn't allowed to leave. Thankfully either he forgot or was bluffing, but I tried the door and booked it into someone's backyard. I wasn't so much frightened as I was trying to get the taste in my mouth. Thanks for listening yet another episode of Nightmare Hours. If you love our stories, do hit that subscribe button. Good night, folks, and see you tomorrow at the same time.